Master Blast. It's just says scheduled. Through the prayers mm-hmm. of the Holy Fathers, the Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us. Amen. Amen. Okay, give me just one moment. I have to quickly check here. Okay. Um, okay, uh, and so we're live. Um, basically... Uh, today, I guess uh, we've got a couple of requests for video reviews. We're gonna try to do both of them. Um, I can, but I will say that uh, you know I'm gonna try to put them at 1.25. We're kind of on a constrained schedule today, so you want to get your questions in early, uh, as quickly as you can. Um, hopefully, we uh, we can cover everything. Uh, we did get two requests. Uh, I'm gonna go in chronological order of most recent. So uh, we did get this, which was, um, I guess, it was a review by um, a review of, uh, by Gavin Ortland, who is a Protestant uh, apologist known as Truth Unites on YouTube, and I will I will mention correspondence at the very end because that is of note. Um, and so we're going to just go through it. We're going to listen to it. We're going to go one point two five just to make sure that we can get through it all. And so let's go. We often hear this appeal about the fullness of the faith, sometimes from Eastern Orthodox Christians, sometimes from Roman Catholic Christians, sometimes from others. Uh, It's like, uh, you know, we're not denying that God is at work out there, but we possess the fullness of the faith. And this can sound very appealing and inviting and so forth. Uh, Ruslan has a great channel. You've probably heard of him. And he had Jonathan Peugeot on recently and another guest. And Jonathan Peugeot expressed this sentiment in their interview. Why should I be an Orthodox Christian? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my gosh. I love that question. This just cut to the chase. I'm not that kind of a guy. But <laughs> I know. I know. This, like, this is like the worst you, thing. You can't answer that question. Like, this is not for him. This is it. No, so I would say, like, yeah. I, I would, can all, all yeah. I can tell you is the way that I came to discover in Orthodoxy mm-hmm. the fullness of the faith. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's the best way to understand mm-hmm. it. And, like, even now, today, I don't I don't think that people who that aren't Orthodox aren't Christian or that they're all going to hell or all that We're kind of stuff. We're still in. I'm still in. I think I think that okay. I think I see it as a hierarchy, like okay. a, a kind of hierarchy of participation. Like I see most things. It's a great so, okay. you know. so Orthodox are at the high at the peak of the hierarchy. <laughs> Then, then, the top, then, then you got Protestants, Catholics. Who's that? Well, just tell me. I'm, oh, I'm no, on this, top. Is, a bad this game. is horrible. This is a so, bad game. <laughs> uh, let's see. What that's not doing. an easy question to answer. He does a good job going on from there, trying to rank some of the different traditions. Uh, Jonathan seems like a nice guy, and I appreciate the more ecumenical posture of his answer to that. But what I want to argue in this video is that that's not the historic Eastern Orthodox view. Um, I, I'm not really just responding to Jonathan, though, because that's a common way of thinking today. The, this, this, let, let's give a label to it. So let's call this uh, a hierarchical way of construing the one true church claim. You heard that word hierarchy come up in Jonathan's answer. It's, it's this idea that, you know, there's the one true church, but then there's kind of a spectrum or a gradation going out from it. Some other traditions are closer, others are further away. And sometimes you'll hear this sentiment that, you know, we know where the church is, but we don't know where it isn't. The boundaries are a little more porous. It's a little more mystical. And this is just to show that I'm not just trying to single out him. I, I watched this video and I thought, oh, you know, I got to talk about this. Um, but that's a very common view. Timothy Ware, who has a, a very erudite book about orthodoxy. I'll put up his statement. He has a similar position there. He's a little bit more moderated or inclusive in his construal of this. So the basic idea here is, you know, you've got these major Christian traditions outside of Protestantism, Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, Oriental Orthodoxy, the Assyrian Church of the East. They all claim to be the one true church. So they're all seeing themselves as, to the exclusion of the others, the original church that Christ founded. Uh, but then there are variations in how that's construed. You know, where where what does that mean for these other traditions in terms of their I don't self- think the Assyrian Church of the East There's lots of... Coming in? I don't. The Nestorians don't really claim to be the one true church. Yeah, I, I don't. I mean, did I don't know if they did historically. I don't. They I don't did, think they did now. Long, I think for some time they did historically, but they've long since abandoned that claim. Okay, yeah, because they're like really in the ecumenical and movement. Even That's most, like, even most of the so-called Orient or the Monophysites, unless you're talking about some like some Ethiopians and some Coptic people you meet on the internet, most of them don't claim that the Monophysite communion is the only true church. Yeah, they'll claim that you know the Orthodox are also <laughs> part of the church, or something. and the Armenians will claim the Roman Catholic Church is part of the church. So I mean, they're they're really ecumenistic. Yeah, and so I think that well, that that's why this video is particularly interesting because he is pointing this out, but then the video takes a bit of a turn. Okay, lots of differences there, but so th- this particular construal, let's call it a, a hierarchical construal. So this is the idea that well, the one true church, you know, Eastern Orthodoxy is the one true church. It has the fullness of the faith. But then there's kind of a gradation stepping stemming outwards, and there's uh, you heard very clearly from Jonathan. There's definitely Christians and salvation outside. Um, while I appreciate that sentiment, what I want to argue and document 
in this video is that that's not the historic Eastern Orthodox view. That's actually, though people don't like hearing this, a more Protestant way of thinking. The more historic way of thinking is what I'll call the Noah's Ark view. This is a different way of construing the one true church claim and its implications. So we got the hierarchical view, and then we got Noah's Ark view. This is definitely, the Noah's Ark model is more black and white. It doesn't have these, bound, these porous <laughs> boundaries. Basically, the consequence of this view is if you're not Eastern Orthodox, you're damned. Uh, the presumption is you got to become Eastern Orthodox to get saved. Or if this view was articulated in a different tradition, you could substitute a different tradition for it for the, rather than Eastern Orthodox. So the idea is basically that, you know, there's no spectrum or gradation going outward here. It's like, you know, the, the metaphor is Noah's Ark. Uh, and this is all throughout the tradition for this doctrine of no salvation outside the church. <laughs> and basically, you know, uh, uh, you could say whether you're five yards outside the Ark of Noah or five miles, either way, you're in the water. And so you're not going to be saved because you're not on the Ark. Uh, being on the Ark is the only possible way. Okay. And basically, what I want to argue is that historically, it was more of the Noah's Ark view, uh, a fullness right. of the church, a hierarchical okay. view, One all of that. Okay, so what he's describing, like you can find that that goes back to the the New Testament and the church fathers. Mm -hmm. that, and yeah, I mean, and even the church, in the, the rudder. The, church, has, the reality is you're either in the uh, church of Christ or you're outside the church of Christ. Exactly. The, the, the ship of the church is imagery that has been used uh, from time immemorial. I mean, the Noah's Ark... Uh, you find that reference used by St. Augustine, St. Bede, like St. Cyprian, St. Gregory. Um, Even the also, shipwreck is a reference to it in St. Basil. Yes, so you, you you find that. Now, what is true is that you will have some, um, like, you read some things from Father, Father Seraphim Rose or maybe St. Tikhon as a dance or something like that. And they will say that, you know, or there's the famous document by St. Philaret of uh, New York, which one asks them, were the heterodox saved or something. Mm -hmm. And the implication is that if heterodox are saved, it's not because they were heterodox. Somehow, uh, before they die, like maybe they repent. And, you know, who knows? But you can you have to be part of the Orthodox Church to be saved. That's that's fun. That's fundamental. Thing. Yeah, and I think that he. I mean, for all intents and purposes, as an outsider, he's really kind of nailed the historic position. Here. Yes, that's true. That is modern innovation. Yeah. And to the extent that modern Eastern Orthodox Christians accept that, they should scale back their claim of being the unchanging church because that's a change. So let me document that and give an overview. And I'll just clarify here that I'm going to focus on the 9th to the 19th centuries. So basically from a little before the time of the Great Schism between the East and the West, and then looking at how they each viewed each other. Uh, the Church Fathers is more complicated. I have a different video on that. There's definitely more variation then. So you have people no, early on, like not. Justin Murder, who talk about how there's <laughs> hey, I, there yeah, is not no. variation <laughs> on that. that apps, I, mean, I, I, I didn't really want to listen to these, Christ. but now that I'm listening to them, I'm getting a little bit agitated with my coffee. So uh, Sorry. now I want to listen to this other video where he supposedly the church fathers teach that there's no one. You want me to go look for that one? I don't. Let's go ahead. Let's go, let's get through this one. We were asked to do it. Go ahead and throw it. So Socrates, who uses his reason, is a member of the body of Christ and so forth. And so people, you know, you, know, you might argue no, that, you could apply oh, that to Christ, to even to pagan. He's, he's, he's mentioning St. Justin Martyr talking about Socrates was like a Christian before Christian. That, that's talking about before the time of Christ. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Who live after the coming of Christ, after the incarnation, and there's debate about that. I'm also uncertain about some of the passages in Augustine that have kind of gone back and forth. Uh, we know which passages these are. Forth on of like, is he allowing that maybe the Donatists could get saved? And I'm not. No, the, I can tell you. What is true is Saint Apat. What is true is Saint Apatus and Milovus in this text mm -hmm. against the Donatists. Saint Apatus has the view that the Donatists, when they die, uh, because they're not he, 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 because they're not intentionally trying to be here. There is a sort of this view that remember when the Donatist schism happened, people forget that it was like ninety nine percent of the North African church outside of, outside of uh, uh, Egypt that went yeah. along with it. So it was so some of them still had this idea that the Donat so called Donatists were sort of like uh, a groups of bishops, churches that had broken with the rest of the church, but they may have still been sort of a, a, a local church out of communion with other local churches. Yeah, That's a little I mean, bit different I, than claim. But one is is that so I can tell you. I'd like to know what, what passages he's pointing to where St. Augustine claims that like the Donatists can be saved. St. Yeah, Apatis and Milovus claims that the Donatists, just, if they die, they will go to Hades, but they won't be damned forever. They go to the upper level. Right, and and St. Augustine generally held to the position, and we this is one of those arguments about grace and the mysteries, but the, the point is that it, it hurts the people that receive it um, because they're... The most you're heretic. going to get from St. Augustine, the, mo the most that they can, they can peel off from St. Augustine, is that I think he would probably say that babies that were baptized by Donatist clergy would be saved because, and yeah. because that's 
that's on the basis of his underst- of his teaching, his peculiar view from the doctrine of Baptists of baptism and such. But that's because they would be unconscious members that were and such. That's a pretty funny comment. Ironic a Protestant apologist as a sounder ecclesiologist, chief and patriarch Bartholomew. <laughs> I think I think yeah, I think what it is is that he has a sounder <laughs> understanding of what the facts are. Even though he does not agree with Orthodox. Yeah, He's obviously guy, a heretic or heterodox. I, I'm mean. pretty sure Gavin's real, but maybe he is using to uh All right, well, let's, to, uh, let's, 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 let's continue. Let's go through it. Let's, um, and there's lots more we could comb through. You know, how do we understand Cyprian's doctrine of no salvation outside the church in the third century? We have there's one no million total Christians. Yeah, it's pretty minority. clear. He's applying that to heretical groups like the Gnostics and the Marcionites. And then, no, so then, no, then no, 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 no. Salvation outside the church. Saint Cyprian of, of Carthage even applied that to Novatians, who had yeah. almost zero. Had, who basically the only difference they had from the church was they didn't believe you could uh, you could undergo penance after you committed a deadly sin. All right, so I'm gonna. I, I've lowered his volume just a little bit so we can kind of speak on equal terms with him. Okay. And grows, and then you've got the union of church and empire in the fourth century, and this starts to become more absolutely and more restrictively. And then you could try to trace out, and, and I guess I could just say leave no. room for further review of kind of these earlier times. No. I don't have enough knowledge. I've, I've looked into a little bit, like yeah, in the fifth century, the crystallized. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of. I'm not trying to be. I, I, forgive me if I'm sounding uh, arrogant. I don't mean to sound. Like, it's just. No, I, you I, don't sound arrogant. But this I, is this I, is this is a this is a. I, you cannot it's, use the church fathers to justify any Protestant group. You simply cannot. Work. Yeah, it's it's. I I like to call this like um the kind closest, of collegiate level church fathers the, survey. The closest, type. the close, the, the Protestant groups that have that could make the closest claim would be like Anglicans and and confessional Lutherans. But even that breaks down. Yeah, by the time of their like understanding of ordination, etc. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Then it's, it starts to really. It, it's only an external appearance. Yeah, logical schisms. Um, you know, the Chalcedonians and the non-Chalcedonians are both anathematizing each other. It's clear they're not; they don't like each other. But I don't know enough about the history to know if there were any exceptions or not. There were that as much. Let me focus here on the, this millennium, from the ninth to the nineteenth century. So basically, leading up to the times where the tensions between East and West are strong enough that people might wonder: Are those Westerners over there who affirm the filioque saved? I've combed through this as much as I can before I uh, debate I had with an Eastern Orthodox priest because this this doctrine is actually one of my top concerns about Eastern Orthodox. I wonder who he I debated about with. this tradition. This is one of my major concerns: the exclusivism. And basically, I have to be honest with you and say, I have not been able to find any, not a single one, affirmations that non-Orthodox Christians like Roman Catholics or Protestants can be saved during this span of time. And I've asked people over and over, and what people relentlessly do is just tell me that that's not the orthodox view, but don't give historical documentation for that. I've not found any counterexamples. Uh, you know, in- that's because that it is know, the orthodox this reminds view. Me of, this reminds me of the whole debacle that happened with figures like um, Joshua Shooping. Yeah, well, he interviewed uh, Shooping as soon as yeah. he left. And, and the situation with, I can't remember his name, he was that one Antiochian guy who later left to join the Union, where they were reading like 10th 11, 12, 14th, 15th, 16th century Orthodox material, and yep. it was like teaching the atonement, uh, like traditional atonement doctrine. That, exactly. And then, and, and then they go to seminary or they go to whatever, and they're getting loaded up with Romanides or, Rom- or semi Romanides teaching. And, and, then, and they get this stuff. And... That happened to me when I was 16, 17, when I was looking to Orthodoxy. And it, it just, it, it, you know, you read the Church Fathers, you read Orthodox catechetical material. And then you're suddenly told that nobody, you know, it was only to the, you know, 20th century that suddenly Orthodox understood their own doctrine. Yep. And, and, and so, and, and this, and I mean, at least you can say for this Mr., uh, what's his name, Ortland, that, you know, he has a clear understanding of that the Orthodox Church teaches it is the Orphan Salvation. I am, I'm kind of curious to see his debate with the priest. I wonder if the priest told him that directly or actually just was like, well, you know, I mean, you got to wonder. Uh, any kind of major Eastern Orthodox theologian or council or really anything within Orthodoxy is saying, oh, well, you know, it's possible that a Roman Catholic could be saved or a Protestant could be saved and that kind of thing. Um, so let me just uh, document this. The, base, the basic theological framework here seems to be that perceived Western innovations like the filioque are heresy. The filioque is the idea that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, and this is maintained in the West. And this was seen in the East among Eastern Orthodox Christians as heresy. So heresy places you outside of the canonical boundaries of the Orthodox Church. To be outside of the church is to be cut off from the grace of the Holy Spirit given in the sacraments, and therefore it is to be cut off from salvation. Yep. And this is a particular way of understanding the unity of the church. The, uh, the, the the recurrent metaphor is the Ark of Noah. If you're not on the Ark, you're in the water. 
if you're not in the church, you're uh, like explicitly, knowingly Eastern Orthodox, because that's another way we'll talk about later. People try to qualify things in ways that are not historically authentic. Mm -hmm. so, so just to be clear, the claim on the table, what I'm arguing is that consistently from the 9th to the 19th century, Eastern Orthodox Christians taught that if you affirm the filioque, you are damned to hell. That's the view. Okay. That's the, stand, that, start with this. that's the standard Orthodox view. Now, what St. Photius says mm -hmm. in his mystagogy is that uh, he, he does say something. I have to get it out. He does say that because they were trying to rent some of the, uh, like, I think, I guess, really probably Rantram and others writing through him were trying to say, well, St. Augustine or St. Ambrose talked with the Leoque and such. What St. Photius actually says is that people who knowingly affirm heretical teaching, after they have been confronted by pastors and other Orthodox about it, then yeah, your soul, your your heresy separates a man from God. Because obviously, you can have cases of people who are who are formerly part of the church, right? And they may come to erroneous conclusions about things. But it's it's still basically the same. Just that's yeah, what uh, yeah. Or modify or whatever. Eighteenth century Orthodox monk and theologian Paisius Velchovsky, Velikchovsky. I always, I, people dispute the pronunciation of both his first and last name, but it's Velichkovsky. I can never say that right. And I usually hear Paisius. But anyway, he's, but I've heard different too. But anyway, he's responding to a, a priest who, and he's basically warning him about the filioque. And he sets the stakes pretty high. He says that the filioque is the first and most important of all the heresies. And basically he says that, that the rejecting the filioque is the unanimous position of the church. So if you affirm it, you have no hope of salvation. Quote, all the holy ecumenical teachers who have interpreted the scripture as if with one mouth, Say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, and nowhere have they written that He proceeds from the Son. Also, where does he live? Unions think exactly like the Romans in such a Come again? heresy. What? Uh, anyway, yeah. I, I, I anyway, nothing, never. Nothing, nothing. This is interesting. Someone just asked. I thought Orthodox never spoke on who does or doesn't go to hell. Oh well. Well, you're you're gonna learn some today. Um, <laughs> hope do they have for salvation? unless they openly renounce this spirit-fighting heresy and become united again with the Holy Orthodox Eastern Church. Now, Uniate Christians or Uniate churches are Eastern churches that maybe historically were Eastern Orthodox or Oriental Orthodox, but they're in full communion with the Church of Rome and uh, even while they retain their own liturgy. And so Velichovsky is bas basically making it clear that if you're among those churches, you know, you're without salvation. That's the entailment of his words. What hope do they have for salvation unless they openly renounce? Then he puts it even more clearly, depart and flee from the unia as speedily yep. as possible, lest death overtake you in it, and you be numbered among the heretics and not among the Christians. Yep. So you can see the stakes he's setting here in his warning. He's saying, turn, depart, run from the filioque way, lest you die. What hope would you have of salvation unless you openly renounce that? Okay, now someone can say, Felichowski is just one theologian, but what I'm arguing is that that perspective is just what I see. Basically, I think I'd have to say unanimously in the pre-19th century Orthodox thought, really the 19th century too. I just remember that there's disputed maybe one or two possible exceptions there, but very rare, even in the 19th. It's really not until the 20th where you see a sizable alternative. So in the 17th century, for example, you have this crisis uh, where basically you have a patriarch of Constantinople who's sounding a little bit too Protestant, even too Calvinist in some of his views. The 1672 Synod of Jerusalem meets, produces the Confession of Decithius, who's the patriarch of Jerusalem. This is an official approved formally approved statement of eastern orthodox belief it categorizes repeatedly protestant wait i, I thought he, he i i assume he's referring to carol lucaris but was, yeah, wasn't he patriarch the, yeah it wasn't he patrick of alexandria not constantinople uh i think he was patriarch of alexandria first then he got promoted to okay. patriarch of constantinople oh uh, okay how you're they, right how they did it as wicked heretics and in the context of opposing this protestant idea that the office of priest and bishop are the same it says the dignity of the bishop is so necessary in the church that without him neither church nor christian could either be spoken could either be or be spoken of he is we affirm as necessary to the church as breath is to man or the son to the world then note the consequence that is drawn from this when these forsake the church they are forsaken by the holy spirit and there remains in them neither understanding nor light but only darkness and blindness so this is not a matter of the fullness of the faith this is a noah's ark view you know, if you're not in the church, if you're not connected to the bishop, which is a distinct office from from priest, then you are in darkness and blind. You, the Holy Spirit has forsaken you, and so forth. For which the, is, I, I will note that this is a good point to make versus people who say you don't have to worry about the bishop; just be under a good priest. Um, you have to worry about the bishop. End of the 19th century, the patriarchal encyclical of 1895 is responding to Leo the Thirteenth's invitation to unity with Rome, and it maintains the same position: Roman Catholicism is heretical. 
And in doing so, it's self-consciously operating in a tradition of thought. And then it draws the same implications with respect to salvation. Quote, but as has been said before, the Western church from the 10th century downwards has privately brought into herself through the papacy various and strange and heretical doctrines and innovations. And so she has been torn away and removed far from the true and orthodox church of Christ. How necessary then it is for you to come back and return to the ancient and unadulterated doctrines of the church in order to attain the salvation in Christ after which you press. So that's very interesting. Those final words are making it clear that, you know, these other people are seeking salvation, but in order to get it, it is necessary for them to come back into the ancient and unadulterated church. You have to leave off the filioque, same way of thinking. This is a Noah's Ark construal of the one true church claim. You're either on or you're on the ark or you're in the waters. Um, earlier in the 19th century, you have the 1848 encyclical of the Eastern Patriarchs, a letter issued by the four Eastern Patriarchs in response to Pope Pius IX's epistle to the Easterners earlier that year. And this maintains this basic identification. The filioque is damnable heresy. It's up there with Arianism and the papacy. And it repeatedly refers to the Roman Catholic Church as apostate and heretical. Here's just a one flavor, though it goes on a great length. Quote, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church following in the steps of the Holy Fathers, both Eastern and Western, proclaimed of old to our progenitors, and again teaches today, synodically, <coughs> said novel doctrine of the Holy Ghost proceeding from the Father and the Son is essentially heresy, and its maintainers, whoever they be, are heretics, according to the sentence of Pope St. Damasus, and that the congregations of such are also heretical, and that all spiritual communion and worship of the Orthodox sons of the Catholic Church with such is unlawful. Now, bear in mind, the capital C Catholic there, that's referring to the Eastern Orthodox Church. Historically, the Eastern Orthodox Church has also referred to itself as the Catholic Church. Now, this is the general way of thinking I just find everywhere. I see it in Mark of Ephesus. I see it in the Sigillion of 1583, though that has a disputed textual history, so I won't draw on that. I see it in the longer Catechism of St. Philaret, a significant 19th century metropolitan of Moscow. He uses the same Noah's Ark imagery and says, Basically, you're doing the whole video for us. Necessarily. Yeah, I know. It's great. Of the Catholic Church. Now, so what people do with these passages, because I'm used to this by now, is they'll say, uh, they'll try to interpret these in a modern framework where you can like be a member of the church. Uh, there, there's one visible church, but you can be a member of it invisibly. But that's not what they meant. So people will come along and say, oh, well, yeah, you can be a member of Christ's body, but just implicitly or unknowingly or invisibly or so forth. But if you've been paying attention to these quotes, you see, that's not the idea. The whole appeal is no run from the filioque. How can you be saved unless you openly renounce the filioque and so forth? So this idea of, you know, these modern ways of trying to um, kind of finagle these, the, this teaching to, to make it more workable, this is an innovation. And, and if people would like to say to me, no, Gavin, you're wrong. Um, basically, yeah, there's one true church and you need to be in the one true church to be saved, but you can be in it in some implicit or invisible way. Give me historical documentation for that. Because I don't see that. He's, he's I think it's Protestant. basically unanimous for a millennium to the other direction. And I also think it's the same in the other direction, by the way. Just real brief, in the other direction, the Roman Catholics were, were looking across to the east and saying the same thing. Those people outside of the communion with the Bishop of Rome, they're off the okay. Ark of Noah. Okay. So they're like drowning in the floodwaters of sin. And that it, it, Essentially, he what he, he's right about is that this essentially he's making the point that it, that the, this ecumenist argument is a 20th century invention. Mm -hmm. Historically, orthodoxy <laughs> says it's the true church. Historically, papism claimed it was the true church. And and basically by the 20th century, and you know, those are the only two main claimants by the early 20th century. You know, because yeah. obviously most no. Protestants didn't make that claim, uh, or any of them really claimed that they were the true church. Now this, so, can you hear me? Spirit, yes. yes. Um, this guy's last name is Ortland, right? Yeah. Yes. Well, there's Ray and uh, Annie Ortland, famous evangelicals. I think they were in California. He must be their son. So uh, he's maybe. part of a he's exactly. part of a family that was well established in the evangelical world. Uh, but another point I want to make you were absolutely go ahead. right. Uh Gavin Ortland is Ray Ortland's son. Yep. So well established in evangelicalism. But you know what's really I catch from this guy is this is that he's saying all these criticisms but he's never addressing the content of why the Eastern Church condemned this stuff. He's just saying they're condemners. They're just, you know, telling everybody that they're on their way to hell. But he's never saying what the issue was. And so he's glossing well, I, over all kinds I, of stuff. Well, the reason why he's actually doing a, he's actually doing a good work for us, in my opinion, because what he's doing at the beginning of the video, he cites um, Jonathan Pago. Uh, who is a world Orthodox guy who basically is saying, well, no, 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 like non-Orthodox 
don't have the fullness of the faith. They just have part of it. And he's like, that's that's a made up. That and he's right on that because that's what the, the you know, unfortunately a lot of the ecumenists claim that, you know, we don't know, we know where the church is, but we don't know where it is and blah blah blah. That sort of uh sort of stuff. But uh yeah, I mean <coughs> I'm gonna go through a little of the Roman Catholic stuff. I mean it's not really much, but let's, we let's just, continue. Let's just get through the video. They have to okay. come into communion with the one true church in order to be saved. There's only a few Jesuit theologians in the early modern era that seem to have articulated a different view that was very controversial and, and kind of squashed. So although the modern Roman Catholic view is certainly much more inclusive, like after Vatican II and certainly even before Vatican II, um, the historic view I've documented in other videos, so I won't really document it here. I've talked about the Unum Sanctum, which basically says, you know, you have to submit to the Pope to be saved. I've talked about the Cantata no, I, Domino, no, that's, uh, uh, from the Council of Florence. In the yeah, this century. is all Roman, the Roman no, I Catholic. I should say that Unum Sanctum, um, because it, was actually um, controversial when it was issued back in the 1300s. Like there were a lot of like the, a lot of the French uh, Roman Catholics and things objected to it, but they objected to it on the basis of the claim that uh, the papacy was a centralizing figure. Um, although they still would have said the so-called Western Church was the church. Yeah. So which has again a very strong and explicit affirmation of a similar idea. I'll just respond to one of the counter arguments I saw recently, just today, when I was already planning on making this video. Dave Armstrong put out a video on and tagged me. Or Dave not, Armstrong. Uh, he writes a lot of these articles against me, and he tagged me on Facebook. So I, I, given the topic, I gave it a quick read. He's basically arguing that since valid baptism occurs outside of the Roman Catholic Church, I, I'm not trying to simplify it too much. This is one of the. This is what I detected to be the main argument. Uh, since you have valid baptisms and baptism confers salvation, salvation must occur outside of the Roman Catholic Church. And I'll put up this passage. You can see what he's arguing from that. And then he's concluding that my argument's been utterly defeated and so forth. There's so, only one, there's actually read, only one problem with Armstrong's argument here, and that's conditional baptism. Uh, it is not a consistent position that the Roman Church always accepted Orthodox mysteries. That's that's not Or true. even Protestant. They, they never accepted. Yeah, exactly. As a, as a rule, Roman Catholicism received almost all Protestants by ab novo or subconditione baptism until like 1970. Exactly. So, you know, Dave Armstrong, as usual, is... Wrong. They would they would make How? a theoretical admission that you could have valid baptism. But then yeah. they would say that, well, if you got it outside the Roman Catholic Church, it would essentially be inactive until you reconcile. Yeah. And such. Right. So, so, I mean, even... The even, yeah. Domino okay. continues, it addresses the status of those who have a valid sacrament outside of the one true church it says the unity of the ecclesiastical body is of such importance that only for those who abide in it do the church's sacraments contribute to salvation so the fact that a baptism could be valid for someone entering rome doesn't mean it was salvific for someone remaining out that seems explicitly opposed here i mean the language is very clear only for those who abide in the body of Christ, do the church's sacraments contribute to salvation? If baptism is this sort of automatic mystical conveyance into the body of Christ, this warning makes no sense. There would be no possibility to get baptized, have a valid baptism, but not be in the body of Christ. So the statement would be meaningless if baptism automatically conferred salvation. That's not what it's saying. And again, people just read the modern ideas back into these historical sources. Right I'm very that. much consistent yeah. with the scholarship it's on just, this, even Roman Catholic it's just, he's scholars. He's a Protestant saying he doesn't you agree with it, but this is what Christian faith. Well, There's no well, implicit submitting to the Pope. You know, that's another... Well, well this is where it gets interesting, because this part he's going to talk about modern Roman Catholicism, but the rest of his video, um, about eight minutes, is going to be dealing with how he has a Protestant response to these, which is where we can really engage okay. actual ideas where he's, you know, okay, wrong. Ahead of the um, qualifications people introduce. People say, well, yeah, 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 you have to submit to the Pope and you have to be a member of the church, but that can happen implicitly. But that is not the medieval view. That's a modern innovation. It, it has no, if, if, a, if an interpretation is being put forward of these magisterial documents and it has zero historical precedent for 600 years, then why should we take it seriously? I, I don't think there would be one single medieval Pope who would have recognized that. Like you can be sort of unknowingly in the church or implicitly in the church or something like that. Um, they didn't have a conception for that any more than they thought you could be unknowingly on the Ark of Noah. And I'm again, I'm consistent with the Catholic scholarship on this point to the extent that I've engaged it. Here's Francis Sullivan, a Catholic scholar. The teaching of St. Thomas and of the whole medieval tradition required explicit Christian faith for the salvation of everyone in the Christian era. After the suppress suppression of the Jesuit order, hardly any Catholic theologians dared to question the traditional teaching on this point. It's only then in the modern era that that changes. This also raises a practical concern about the value of an allegedly infallible magisterium. We're told we need this to interpret the deposit of faith. But if everyone can misinterpret the magisterium itself for 600 years, 
then the practical utility of it seems to be greatly reduced. How do we know that 600 years from now, it won't be overturned again? And we'll just you know say, well, this is a great away. argument about no, why yeah. it's not like that in the medieval is, is absurd. And, and yeah, no, he, he definitely makes a very, he's making a solid problem, case though, for, is this can't really be applied to the, because you, obviously it can't be applied to orthodoxy. It can be applied yeah. to world orthodoxy, so cold, all right? But, right, but it can't be applied to any Orthodox whose position is consistent. Because remember, papism is is established fundamentally upon one central office and the yep. that. So all, he, that if, is the, if, the whole. If that religion. guy goes down, if that institution goes down, and you've tied everything to it, then you, yeah, you got major problems. Yep. Thankfully, right. the biblical patrician tradition doesn't tie it to one bishop. There's, you know, the the there's a there's a, a synodality. Catholicity and all the bishops of Orthodoxy, so that if a group of bishops apostatize, you are not bound. In fact, you have a, you are obliged to separate from public heretics. Absolutely. Um, and so here's where he's about to start the Protestant argument in like ten seconds. So okay. here we go. Era. Nobody had these modern ways of of getting around this. Uh, and I actually think, and here's where I want to talk about why Protestantism, and to finish off, I think is a better option on this point of no salvation outside the church, because we affirm that doctrine. But here's where we differ. And first, let me just say a point of appreciation for Jonathan and his his own position on the filioque. That's not what the creed was talking about at the outset. Mm -hmm. At least not what the Orthodox understood the creed to be talking about. Then it became very difficult for them to finally, you know, go along with that, that mm -hmm. proposition. Mm -hmm. But you'll find the idea that in terms of creation, mm -hmm. that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son. You find that in Eastern Fathers as well. Like I think Jonathan's I, that, position First of all, I don't think that's true. Um, and I think he said in true. the process of creation. He's talking about a temporal, is he, okay. is he referencing temporal procession, which is not eternal procession? Okay, well, he said it in because, such a muddled that's way, not, I didn't That's hear not that. procession in the way, in, in the way the Yeah, that's temporal procession it's just is different. Holy Ghost, the, the Son, there's, if it's just the Son sending the Holy Spirit, in a temporal sense, this is that's not what that was never. Yeah, never the no, I agree. I agree. Is much more. I, I wish the historic views were as fair-minded as Jonathan. I think he's absolutely right. Okay, well, the maybe Mr. Kind of this is this these. is the problem I've seen with some of these guys is they try to say, well, um, when it says Christ breathes on the apostles and says, "Receive the Holy Ghost, who sends out us forgive," you know the verse in John twenty, yeah, 22, 21, 22, that that justifies the filioque way. Uh, that's and and then they'll quote maybe Saint Jerome or Saint Ambrose talking about thus the spirit proceeds from the sun or something like that. Yeah, in but that's happening in, in time. In reference to a temporal procession that has nothing to do with the hypostatical origination and eternity of the of the person yeah. of, of of the sun of the of the, the Holy Ghost. Uh, in fact, you will find from like the there was a council in um in the Ecumenical Patri uh, the Constantinople like in fifteen eighty seven. Which anathematized anyone who talked about the eternal procession of the of the Holy Ghost from the Father and the Son, though it said that there was a temporal procession from both. But that's but that temporal procession is just an act of sending, all right. So you know the Orthodox Church always clearly distinguished between the concept of the eternal hypostatic procession, and that can only be from who the Father, right? So that's that's like the side. monarchy of so Father. The whole, the whole, like, Paisius Velochowski was saying, as though the whole church spoke with one voice, one way or the other. But ultimately, I feel this is a good reason to be a Protestant Christian. Protestants are often, people often misunderstand my appeal, so let me clarify this. I'm not advocating for universalism. I've had people say, well, you guys anathematize people too. You guys think people are damned as well. Yeah, totally. We're not saying it's universalism or there's no boundaries. The point of distinction between Protestantism and the other major Christian traditions is institutional exclusivism. Okay. So basically, we have boundaries, but we do not restrict the one true church to one institution. So then you're doing the exact same thing Jonathan McGough's doing. I mean, ultimately, the yeah, argument. I think so. I think his, yeah, his, what he's saying is effectively Jonathan McGough is right, but he's completely ahistorical when talking about the Orthodox tradition. So I agree with you. What I, what, what I guess he's going to say here is that uh, Christian faith has to do with sort of an internal mental acquiescence. Uh, well, let's let, let's find out. Let's let's figure this one. I, 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 I've never heard. I never heard this part. So, uh, stated differently, we affirm that the one true church coheres within multiple institutions, and I've documented, and we and we do that with historical consistency because I know lots of contemporary Christians and other traditions agree with me. But I'm saying that's a departure. That's an innovation. We do that with historical consistency. In my five minute case for Protestantism video, I documented this. Luther and Calvin thought there's true churches all over the place outside of Protestantism. They even criticized the Catholics for damning the Orthodox. And they said, no, they're, you know, how can you do that? Um, okay, okay, wait, 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 wait. <clears throat> I, can, I can tell you that 
uh, Calvin, from what I, my remembrance years ago, and maybe others can, I'm reading the Institutes of the Christian Religion and a few other letters, that Calvin thought Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy, that they were idolatrous, and yeah. that they did not have true faith. Yeah, so, um, I, mean, I can also tell you that Luther himself said, by the time by the time you're getting to like the 1530s and 40s, that he did not believe he believed the Rome the papacy was not just the Antichrist, but the Roman Catholic Church was was the could not be saved again. If you know I think he made a caveat that if you were presented with Lutheran teaching, which he claimed was the true gospel, and you rejected it, then there was there were no hope of salvation. I mean, not there. I, I years ago you could I remember a few stories of Lutheran pastors um telling people that you know Roman Catholics that they weren't going to be saved. Well they, we remember the so, three answers also of Patrick Jeremiah's to the Lutheran delegation. Yeah. Um they were, you know, he attempted to politely correct some of their errors and they flipped out. And their yeah. response was uh, They were hoping almost, he would just assume he would acquiesce to Lutheranism. Yeah, and they and when that didn't happen they, they got mad and he just said don't bother writing me. So this idea is kind of silly that the reformers held some sort of kind of view. The, not only an ecumenist view, but also like this like a condescending view towards all these other warring factions, whereas they recognize them all, and that's just not true. I mean, they maybe need to, maybe they need to come with Joachim Westfall in Saxony. He told yeah. them he told the uh, the Calvinist exiles from England during the time of Queen Mary that if they showed up in Saxony, they'd all be on the chopping block. Yep, and he was the head of the Lutheran and, Church there. And there is there's like a, a spirit of relativism here because there are no absolute truths. This yeah. is what he's saying that every all the Protestants just pull together and they ignore all their differences and just to criticize uh, the Roman Catholics or the Orthodox. But it's all relativistic. They don't. So he's glossing over, like I said before, he's glossing over the facts of the situation. And basically all of Protestantism is glossing over all the theology and all the fine points, and they just have a broad brush. And so, and so therefore, we're all fine. Yeah, I mean, so look, it, look, look at it like this. This is, this is the, one of the reasons the Reformation disintegrated basically within five to seven years after into it was over, like, as soon as, like, Karl Stadt denies the real presence. Calvin and, and Zwingli go down essentially the, a similar path. All right? Because remember, the Lutherans were claiming that there is a bodily corporal presence in the Eucharist, and they still maintained uh, the adoration at the major elevation. And Calvin said, that's idolatry, and you're idolatrous. All right? And there was really no, I mean, either you either you believe you're worshiping Christ, or, you, or, or, or it's just a piece of bread. All right? So and, it's a free-for-all. It's a free for all. So, so uh, authority, is, yeah, authority is broken Anabaptist. down. And uh, there is no, for example, there is no doctrinal unity among Protestants. It does not exist. It, it's they couldn't even. Um, I think when the Church of England, uh, I, I remember uh, Brian Milady on EWTN years ago. He said he was a he's a Dominican. He said that when England split from Rome, they couldn't even agree on where to meet to have their first meeting. See, so so everything is atomized. They've lost their authority. They can't even agree with one another in the Church of England. And of course, all the Protestants can't even agree with each other. The Lutherans couldn't agree with their version of the uh, what the Augsburg Confession. They're they're battering back and forth on bannering on on what's what and who's who, and and so they're confused as all get out. And so they uh, as they are to this day. You have no. I mean, it's really as a result of probably the, the 18th century enlightenment when there was all these uh, mentions of you don't want to be a bigot and, and such that there were attempts to tone down the controversies between Protestant groups. I mean, you will find, to be honest, there are some like Lutheran groups that survive today. It used to be like the Wisconsin Synod had this view. I don't know if they do. Well, they would say like the Wisconsin Synod was the one true church. Yeah. Because they'd say only we preach the doctrines correctly and such. So yeah, uh, right. so this is kind of a and, I mean, and so, I so that, like this view that oh just believe in Christ and have true faith and just accept him, they because that no, nobody would have accepted that even in Protestantism in the 1580s or 1680s as an accurate representation because they're going to ask what do you believe about Christ? Yep. All right. Because obviously Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon can say the same thing. What if you believe in an Nestorian Christ or a Monophysite Christ or Monothelite Christ? All right. What if you 
you know, is the real presence of biblical doctrine not? You go back to, again, this is the whole Reformation disintegrated over this. Luther, when he had the Marburg Colloquy with Zwingli, said that the real presence is a biblical doctrine and to deny it is not to be a Christian. All right? The right, so, the right of private judgment. They, right. They, exactly. So you're right, you're right. So they have private judgment up until the point that they disagree with you. And the private judgment becomes whatever bully has the strongest voice, the most money, or the best king, he rules. Okay? Yep. So, and that's the same way it is in the churches now. Uh, you know, the toughest guy, the biggest guy, the one with the most influence, his opinion rules the church. And and if you don't agree, you're out. But you so have the liberty to go right. elsewhere, but that's the way it works. Him as a Christian. And, and in a certain way, you've got to remember, they also learned, that was, this is the point St. Justin Popovich, and let's not let the papists get off this, St. Justin Popovich made this, made this point, that the papacy essentially inculcated that attitude were in in the reformers mm -hmm. because they be, it became Martin Luther who was the one who was he was talking about private judgment right up until everybody disagreed with him. Then he had to become essentially his own pope, and the same thing with Calvin. All right, yep. Because then they're assuming all the power. It's it's sort of like they took over the institutions. They kicked out the papist doctrine, the like old doctrines, and then they just took control of the the legal institutions. So well, I think I think it's right when you say that the papacy brought in the right of private judgment because just look at Hildebrand. I am the leading spokesman for all of Christianity. So, and then, and, the, and uh, the other churches, you know, the four other patriarchs, what? But, uh, so he this says, I'm the boss. This name is over every name upon the earth, as yep. it says in the Dictatus Popeye. The private judgment of one man as Bishop of Rome becomes the determiner for everything else. That's right. right. Private Private judgment very quickly then becomes public judgment upon everybody else and everything. All right, let's see if he's got any okay. like other arguments here besides this, which was not very good. Fellow as fellow Christians, historically Protestants have recognized the true church is not restricted to one institution. So this is the point of distinction that it's an institutional exclusivism that we are concerned about. He's not in these defining other what he means by institution. This is, this yeah, is, he's not. This you, is, he, what is true is you would have like. A, Maybe some Lutherans or Calvinists say that, well, maybe these different Lutheran synods who all hold the same doctrine, uh, but have some sort of argument, they might all be one, that, you know, they might, these, these certain Lutherans might not be schismatic, or these Calvinists might not be schismatic. But he's not, you're not going to find a, 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 a reform in Lutherans in the 16th, 17th century saying you can believe uh, heterodox doctrines and still be part of the church. I mean, right. I, I don't think you're going to find that. And basically, we would say the Protestant position represents an alternative approach to discerning the one true church. There is only one church. Well, we have to point out that if we use his standard of the current position versus the historic position, then the historic Protestant position also <coughs> does not hold to this position. <laughs> but she coheres within multiple institutions. Sadly, the one true church is institutionally fragmented today. And basically what we say, we, it's not that we deny that the church is visible. That's a co another common misunderstanding. We, drawing from St. Augustine and John Wycliffe, have uh, historically affirmed that there is an invisible aspect to the church as well as a visible aspect to the church. So we make that distinction. But in making such a distinction, we're not denying one versus the other. We're not saying it's this rather than this. We're distinguishing between the two. If people act as though we're denying the visible church. But that 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 distinction is extremely modest and reasonable. Basically, all we're saying is... Yeah, but it's subjective. Uh, the problem he's, here... He's, he, he's acting like you have a bunch of Protestant denominations that all have the same doctrine, and they're just having fights over who's going to be the boss. That's basically... Well, yeah, point. and I, I, I do find it kind of funny that he's... He's basically using he's he's basically admitting to the invis invisible church concept while at the same time saying that selectively the visible church exists. He's not defining anything, so for all intents and purposes, it's still invisible. I almost I almost have I almost can predict if we were to watch the other video how he would how he would make this argument. Yeah. But let's, but let's you can on. count how many baptized Christians are in principle. That's the visible church, but only God knows who's truly united to Christ. That's the invisible church. So Judas Iscariot was a member of the visible church, but not a member of the invisible church. You don't even have to use the adjectives visible. And Wait, invisible. now he's counting everybody. Because he just basically said anyone who was baptized. You can use different adjectives, but that's basic point. I think that's completely undeniable. So that's... So, so in other words, what distinguishes a Protestant view of discerning the one true church is not we, that we deny the visible church. It's this 
we deny the the, the church is restricted whoa, whoa, whoa. to one institution. What is oh, okay? Con- okay, when he says a Protestant view and the Protestant position is again. I'm going to ask the question: Which who, Protestants? Which Protestants. And that's the other problem. I'll, also, I've noticed one thing that he's talking because about because Protestantism is you have historically like four, you know, basically th- two or three, you know, essentially two or three views of Protestantism that hold diametrically opposed doctrinal views on fundamental issues, and they knew it historically. Yeah, In fact, and... remember it. Remember it took the Calvinist King of Prussia a hundred years from from seventeen seventeen to eighteen seventeen. With doing using often brutal tactics to force the Prussian Lutheran Church into a union with Calvinists because the entire Lu- entirety of Lutheranism regarded Calvinists as heretics. Yeah, it would have nothing to do with. It. So, in other, also, words, so in other words, so in other words, they adopted the same mistakes that Rome was doing. They just repeated them themselves. Yeah, yep. they, and, uh, they, know, they criticized I, Rome for all this stuff, and then they did the same mistakes. Well, it's uh, let me let's see how it ends here because now we're getting to the section called assurance of salvation. Conclude the reason this is so important is that it does affect people's assurance of salvation. As you know, the point of my YouTube channel and the point of my life is to help people find assurance, the happy enchantment of knowing that God is your Father and your sins are forgiven and your name is written in heaven and you don't have you're not ninety nine percent sure that you're saved. The Holy Spirit has a ministry of testimony to your heart. You're one hundred percent sure that you're saved. And I think the topic of this video. I, look, I respect the Eastern Orthodox tradition and learn from great Eastern Orthodox theologians. It's a significant tradition, but their claim of exclusivity is very concerning to me. And from a practical and pastoral standpoint, the reason it's concerning is because it puts ecclesial anxiety upon people. And frankly, a lot of the other, the Roman Catholic tradition does the same thing. They put a storm cloud over people's heads. And frankly, so does Protestant historically. Yeah, I, Protestant. You, I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't tell you when I was growing up in evangelical and fundamentalist Protestantism, there would be, you know, the, the joke, it was not so much a joke, it happened. You know, someone would say, oh, you know, uh, Elizabeth got saved. And my grandmother would say, well, that's the third time she got saved this year. Um, you know, it was so they, they would always say, oh, I was assured of my salvation by internal testimony of the Holy Spirit. And then like 10 years later, they're like, well, was I really saved? Yep. And it, would, I, it happened over and over again. They did not have a belief in baptism or regeneration. So they couldn't point back and say that they were back. God did something objectively for them as infants. And, you know, they could look back to that as the moment and that they could maybe fall away and lose salvation, but they could always look back and pray and ask forgiveness. It became, no, no, you had to have this this essentially emotive, uh, so-called born-again experience, completely divorced from any sacramental understanding. So it, it became a subjective experience outside of an objective sacramental understanding. And then it all became about your emotional state, no matter what they claim. That's the heritage of the first and really second Charles Finney, Second Great Awakening. Because the whole the test internal testimony of the Holy Ghost you're talking about was always going to be subjective experience and how they describe it. Yeah, and well, what I find <clears throat> here. Oh, go ahead, Father. Well, uh, it's the old uh, little joke there among Protestantisms with the Calvinists versus the Arminians. Calvinists believe in tulips. Uh, Arminians believe in daisies. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. And so they're always reaffirming their salvation every week. Back at the altar call of the church, I, I, I would say this is that Paul told Timothy, the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. Mm-hmm. And so when I go out on the streets and I go t- to these Friday night thing at the Lakeland here, I say the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. And the Protestants will look at me and say, it's the scriptures. It's the scriptures, you know. It says, but the scriptures say that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. And so this guy, Mr. Orland, what I, the question be for him is what is truth? Because the Orthodox Church is upholding a standard. There has to be truth. There has to be a standard somewhere. <laughs> so well, I find it. Uh, speak, in speaking of a standard, I find it kind of funny that you know he's devolving to the simple standard of you know your average tractarian who basically is saying to the effect of you know if you believe in Jesus, you'll be saved and you're assured of salvation. And that is not as historically simple until you get to maybe closer uh, to the 17th or 18th centuries. So I that's, mean, that's really a, that's really a, that's really a late 18th, first Great Awakening, and then really second Great Awakening position. Yeah. So the idea that there's some sort of this is some sort of historical assurance, or this is the way everyone did it, it's completely novel. 
Because and, remember, uh, even, you, you re, even going back into uh, like Institutes of Christian Religion, uh, Martin Bucer, Theodore Beza, the early Cal the Calvinist teachers, I, they would say things like, well, you could fall away, but, but the perseverance of the saints really means you're going to be saved in the end through, you know, uh, by grace. All right. So, uh, you know, even their understanding of, you know, so-called once saved, always saved was not even the same as like the Baptists of the 19th century who deny the possibility of any type of apostasy or any loss of grace. So, um, exactly. so again, you have this you have this invented view that came about probably I'd have to guess in part as a result of the end of the 30 years war and then the beginning of the Enlightenment when there was sort of this attempt to break down. The, the various understandings between the basically two Protestant groups that existed in Europe at the time, uh, and you saw, and, and you know, that took a hundred years to do that, and they and they accomplished it, and it, you know, obviously, Protestant had a degrading effect no matter what. It's something right, so, going to give. So. Well, there's two minutes left, so let's okay. finish this up. Into conversion, because people are afraid they're going to get damned. I really, I see it. I see that playing out, and it burdens me from a pastoral angle. So let me just pastor people at the end of this video. You can trust the, the words of Christ himself. Jesus himself said, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. When you come to judgment day, you can stake your everlasting salvation or damnation on the words of Christ. You can say, Jesus, I'm trusting that you won't damn me because you're not a liar. And on judgment day, you can even repeat these words back to Christ and say, look, I repented of my sins. I surrendered my life to you. I took up my cross and I followed you on the basis of your promise. Okay. Now I'm appealing to you. Be true. So you have to obviously believe, know who Christ is. and You, ha you can't just... If, if the Jehovah's Witness presents Arianism to you and they say the same things, that, you know, I, I when I grew up in evangelical Protestantism, you know, it, we the standard view among those who understood doctrine would be that if you did not present in your gospel message the, the divinity of Christ, then you were presenting a false Christ. Even if, and, and I, and in fact, that was a major problem because many of these youth pastors I, I knew growing up when I was like 13 and 14 would simply. You know, by the time they finished with their five minute message or six minute message, you know, you would go and people I did the altar call and they, you know, said the sinner's prayer. I went around and asking them who was G asking these people who was Jesus and what does it mean that he's the son of God to these people? Uh, and they were supposedly saved after this event. And, you know, I said, is Jesus uh, equal in his divinity in, in, to the father? And they say, no, no, no. He was just a man who was adopted to be son. Of so they didn't even understand. All right. Yep. So it's not just you can't simply quote words of our Lord out of the context of who Christ is. You have to have a clear presentation about these teachings. All right. And remember, our Lord said, he who does not eat my flesh and does not drink my blood has no life in him. Yeah. He that, uh, but if, want, if he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Well, I, and that's uh, I think that's what I find particularly painful about this argument, because he's presenting this like you can say these words right back to our Lord to prove that. You know that he has to be good on his his promise, and you miss out all the other things our Lord says, where he doesn't. It's the lowest, always... com it's a lowest common denominator so-called Christianity. That's it's exactly not, right. Not, it's what it yeah, is. it's yeah. just not Christ. Exactly. And I don't. Know. Our Lord, our, people... Otherwise, our, all our Lord had to do was just say a few things and then go right up to heaven. He didn't, you know, after the crucifixion, what would? Yeah. What it, was the point? It's of like C.S. C.S. Lewis with his book Mere Christianity. Yep. They're trying to. Take it down to the lowest denominator, and obviously that's a uh, an indicator of the democratic church. From the right of private judgment, the people have the final say. Each individual has a final say. So it boils down to the lowest common denominator in your church. It kind of rules the day, so they simplify everything. And it's like you said, Vladika, it, context is very important. And so their whole context is uh is uh, uh rebellion against authority is disrespect of authority i'm my own authority and so as a whole culture you have the disrespect okay uh, i'm going okay, let's, to let's go through the rest of the, uh, the film I'm, I'm yeah i'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm, i think i'm here on this one because there's only a minute left we know what he's gonna say um we have some more people on welcome reader john uh welcome carl um and so uh if you have a comment or question this is uh this is uh right about the time to throw it in forgive me this sunday <laughs> uh, forgive me uh, father forgive me uh, okay may god forgive um 
And uh, I just wanted to say, it just seems like he, everything he he spouts, and that's how I use the word spout, um, seems reductionist versus what we would see in orthodoxy is maximalist. We don't create false dichotomies where there's no dichotomy. Right. And uh, it sounds like he's handling religion as institution versus we see churches uh, organism, right? Yeah, we see church as the body of Christ. It's the, you yeah. know, the union of the people. Yeah. And I think to some to some extent, he's kind of externalizing how we see church when we would refer to it properly as a temple. Yeah, um, It seems like but, he has a, a check uh, checklist and he's ticking off the boxes or something like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, great point. Great point. Um, let me see here. Hey, hi, Carl. Hey, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Okay. Um, So I wanted to bring up something that I've noticed listening to a lot of Protestants uh, have theological debates, even with each other, but also with Catholics and Orthodox. Um, Something that they, most of them, I think, at least the more radical ones, they reject what they call uh, Greek philosophy because they say that this is something that's pagan and it's been uh, wrongly brought in and it's led to a lot of problems. This is something they say but they even say it to each other. And so whoever the more radical Protestant uh, is is making the argument, he can attack the other Protestant uh, with this same sort of thing. And I wonder, uh, I know you guys have done a lot of apologetic work, and have you dealt with Protestants who make this objection towards you, and uh, how do you respond to it? The the, the view is that the church fathers, what he's talking about is, again, the view that the church fathers from day one brought in quote-unquote Greek philosophy, all right? Whereas what really happened was that fathers like St. Irenaeus, St. Justin Martyr, recognized that aspects of Greek philosophy uh, were simply in conformity with the scripture. And they had to debate heretics who were uh, and pagans, so they had to use terms like that. Like, obviously, there's a certain degree to which things coming from Platonism and Aristotelianism are just describing, um, you know, realities, all right, that, that as they exist, all right, like things like essence substance, person, hypostasis, you know, will, and what have you. Um, and, you know, I, you know, what I, I mean, look at the New Testament. Um, look in uh, the book of Hebrews. It says the Son of God is the, is the express image of the substance of the Father. All right? So, St. Saint, Saint Paul, or even if you don't believe St. Paul wrote Hebrews, you know, the writer of Hebrews, but it's really St. Paul, was they were using those already. Look at what Saint look at what the Apostle Saint John says in John one. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos. All right, that has certainly been a term used before then. All right, well, it was a pre-Christian it philosophical was going back process. at least to the seventh century in Greek philo- in so-called Greek philosophy, at least you know. But um, I, I I I know what he's talking about. There, I'll simply say that. Um, you can't have Greek, so-called Greek philosophy. So what ends up happening with these groups is they sort of go into Arianism, or they because they have they can't accept the Nicene Creed. Um, they will try to say the other is the uh, more involved in the so-called Great Apostasy than, than the next. Um, I mean, I I, I really I, how how do you deal with that view? You I know, mean, I get, it's just an ahistorical position. I, I don't yeah. Know. One th- one thing that to remember, and this is something that's important, especially when we're talking about uh, doing apologetics traditionally, uh, the traditional Christian apologetic, the Orthodox apologetic, always refers back to the fathers, which means that there's always a place for history and reality. Um, so when somebody starts talking about Greek philosophy, so on and so forth, and we get to things like, as Vladika mentioned, the great apostasy claims, you put them against history. You just have to put them against history. Ask for citations. You're going to find that usually they're quoting either something written off some 19th century yeah, Protestant yeah. making up some you ridiculous... Cannot, you cannot bring Ellen G. White's The Great Controversy to me and expect me to take it seriously. Exactly. Because <laughs> it's bad history leads to bad results. I mean, it's like really bad history. Well, the Church Fathers called the philosophers to account. Like yes. the Apostle Paul did. We take every thought captive. And so they they say that they did not honor God, they did not believe in his salvation, and they went in their personal humanistic direction. Um, yep. They had some things to say which were real, but in the final analysis, 
they failed and they were rebellious and, and didn't submit to God's order. And so you can find all that stuff in the fathers. And so the Protestants, you, you know, you can tell them that it's there. I think the best approach to have when you're dealing with somebody who's trying to dismiss you with Greek philosophy is ask them, frankly, what are you referring to? No, I think what he's saying is that there are Protestants who claim that the church fathers were obsessed with Greek philosophy and therefore they're all false because of Greek Yeah, but you, but you can still call them through to a citation for well, that. You it, still... it, well, it's a way for them to disregard the fathers. Yeah, so you have to force them to re, it, it, you have to force them to address the task. This is the, some, something I've noticed in person. I noticed it on Gab because when these people come, it is especially like these so-called Christian identity people. When you when you begin to ask them questions about what about why would Saint Ignatius of Antioch, as he's getting tortured to death, why would he or Saint Polycarp, why would they like just make up this whole thing, all right, about the Eucharist, the Episcopate, mm -hmm. uh, the, the you know the sacraments that they learn directly. From Saint John, Saint Peter, and Saint Paul, church fathers, you know, you know, it's like it's sort of like the claim that the apostles that you know a lot of infidels use that they claim the apostles, uh, you know, made it all up or they exaggerated everything and they just sort of got tortured to death. Uh, they no one that's that's an absurd claim, all right. I don't think they understand the reality that existed then, uh, that somehow people these twelve men went from cowering uh, in the uh, you know the upper room. And to you know, essentially lions in their in their life, and they went down, uh, being crucified, being beheaded, being flayed, because they saw the risen God, our, our risen incarnate God, Jesus Christ. They knew everything was true. They didn't just they didn't believe it in so in this believe it in this sense of oh I think of an opinion. They right. believed it was a fact. All right. And so when we had Saint when we have Saint Ignatius of Antioch, Saint Clement of Rome. Uh, Saint Polycarp, uh, the early, you know, the early apostolic fathers talking about the sacraments, about the church. They learned this directly from these great apostolic martyrs. Right? Even Saint, even Saint Justin, even Saint Justin Martyr, wasn't he a philosopher? Yes, Saint Justin Martyr was a was a, a, yeah. a Platonic philosopher yeah. who came to faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, All right, because he saw that, that he saw that Platonic this Greek philosophy could only could, could not bring you salvation ultimately. It could, it could only go so far, it, you know, it could describe, it, you could say that there was a God who created the universe, that there was an order to the universe, but it, it's not going much further than that. You have to have was, a revelation. There were shadows of the truth. Exactly. There were, there were seeds yeah. and shadows of the truth that did exist, that's true, but you have to ultimately have God, you have to have prophets that, that reveal everything else, and God himself came to earth, that's who our, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is, uh, and died on the cross and Sent into hell and then rose again from the dead and sent into heaven, establishing his visible church on earth, the Orthodox Church. And it, um, so, Carl, um, are we answering wrote, Carl's question? Yes, I think so. Um, you know, I just I haven't ever talked to anybody about it. I, I've just noticed that it seems almost like a, um, a rhetorical device in which they construct their own metaphysics and then they claim that whatever metaphysical notions or arguments that you bring in. Well, that's just Greek philosophy and it's not biblical. And if you have any logical claim against their arguments, well, that's just Aristotelianism. That's not biblical. And so it's a very convenient thing that they can do. But unfortunately for them, the more radical Protestant can always attack them, you know, from the right or, or the left, however you see it, really. They don't like logical so, argumentation and somebody uses it against them. Yeah, yeah. They, and they it's like they, it. I think like, show me, give me a citation. Give me an instance, yep. and and the, so show well, some, me. It, it, it is fundamental it, absurdity of this position that the apostles died, and then everything just disintegrated immediately. That it's I mean, very, I mean, it, I mean it, comes, it makes a mockery of our Lord's words in, in uh, Matthew, where he says, "The gates of hell shall not prevail." Yep, and when and the is, church is a pillar and ground of the truth, absolutely. and you're exactly yeah. right, Vladika, because they cut it off right there. From the first century, and everything stopped. The miracles stopped. The revelation stopped. Or you know, the prophecy stopped. All that stuff stopped. And so, which really strips the church its total Christian character. In fact, this is this is the art. When I brought this, when, when I was younger, I'm going over now. But when I was younger, and I brought this up to like Baptist pastor, Methodist pastor about the promise our Lord gave in Matthew 16. Uh, and the answer was that oh, he's only talking about 
the belief in the divinity of Christ would never would never end. But our Lord is talking about the church. All right. Now you have to be believe in the divinity of Christ, obviously, to be part of the church. All right. Um, and he's talking about. I mean, our Lord in the gospel says, you know, if a man, uh, you know, you know, you go to the church if somebody, uh, you know, is teaching things wrong, you approach him with, you know, one or two brothers, and then if he refuses to fill it to the church, you know, the public aspect. So our Lord is understanding that there is some sort of institutional framework. I'm not using institution in a legalistic sense, but a framework for his followers. It's in the uh, creed. To deal with. <laughs> I mean, it's, this is not. And he talks. You know, he's, he's not talking about. You know, just some abstract uh, mental belief uh, that you can have. Uh, you know. Well, the abstraction is a way to negate the work of the body of Christ down throughout all the centuries, which is what they do. And so and you, you lose the, the fellowship, the, fel the communion of the saints means the saints that are that have passed but are still alive. And so and are active and the work of the Holy Spirit within the church. And it's like the Psalm, what is 150 says, glorify God in the saints. And so, and they don't really, the Protestant church has no comprehension of that because they erase the work of the Holy Spirit in the saints. I'll never forget in a theology class out there in California, my theology teacher talking about the, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Oh, we have yet to really develop a full doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And I was thinking, I remember that quote and I'm thinking, yeah, gotcha. Well, you, because you know go to the is. Orthodox Church. You know why that is, though, Father. Uh, I think I think Vladika would uh, understand this because I, I I think he might have grown up close to where I currently live, and um, the, their their philosophy their philosophy is no creed by Christ. Yeah, so that those, was Campbellites. Campbellites said that a lot. Yeah, yep. that's and right. That's that's where most of the modern day Baptists get their theology from, I believe. I hope it's and, built on uh, nothing less than Jesus. Blood and righteousness. <laughs> well, see, I, I, you know, I remember listening to Moody Bible Radio when I was thirteen, yeah. and they used to have this um, question and answer program on it. Like a pastor, I can't quite remember. He's Don something. He may have been, you know, he died years ago. Yeah. And um, he sort of wrote this, and people would ask him, "What is the minimum allowed of doctrine you have to believe to be safe?" And his view is that well, you got to believe in the divinity. You could be a Sabellian, you could be a Trinitarian, as long as you believe in the divinity of Christ. Yeah, right. That's from the book, the fundamentals, right? Well, the I five mean, fundamentals. Well, well yeah. let, let's be frank. If, you, if you'd ask the if you'd ask the Episcopalian, the Presbyterian, and the Methodist to write the five fundamentals, they would also have said this implies you got to believe in the Trinity and such. Um, but what happened is that that became too archaic, too 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 restrictive. For many of these uh, uh, so-called born-again types, I mean, they're not really born again. The new birth is connected to baptism, uh, and they had to. They, they had. I mean, we. You know, they were called the Oneness Pentecostals when I was growing up. I don't know if they have a different name now, but they were Sabellians, all right. So they would have said they believed in the divinity of Christ, but they didn't believe in the Trinity as three distinct hypostases, all right. Um, and so you were confronted with these people preaching like in this like. You know, ecstatic way of oh, you got to be born again, um, and what have you. And people were like, well, they seem like they're. And so Baptists and Methodists were like, well, they seem like they're real uh, sincere Christians, and they have faith in the blood of Christ. So, you know, it, because they sound like it, and, yeah, and like, more, their, their more. lives are changed. Well, this is the other problem with the argument I grew up about the so-called changed life, because that and that and people would so they and so. They would say, once saved, always saved. You have your so-called born-again experience. Then you do the baptism, which really is an afterthought. It doesn't really matter because they don't believe in sacrifice. Mm -hmm. They'd reject the Bible in that sense. And then after about a year, you start maybe a lot shorter, you go back to your old ways. And then uh, you, you in, believe in more morally therapeutic theism, right? Yeah. Well, well in, <laughs> and in orthodoxy, what we'd say, if somebody repents, believes in Christ, and is baptized in the church, and they fall back, all right, we would say that you know they 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 you know they they fell into sins, but you should still repent. You, you know, it, we wouldn't say we wouldn't continue to say that your baptism never really was real when when, the, when it happened. Actually, all right, we wouldn't try to. We would say that you lost grace, and therefore you have to be you have to repent um, to uh, have our Lord you know forgive you. Obviously, we, often confession is called like a renewal of baptism. All right, second baptism. 
So this was a, a problem. So this idea of assurance of salvation in, pro, in, in sort of like Protestant teaching, uh, especially first and second great awakening uh, ideas, um, again, that comes with its the, that comes with the same problems. People would say, "Well, I have the internal test." I mean, I don't know. I, mean, I had a Sunday school teacher uh, that I knew throughout my young childhood, uh, right up to you know, I talked to him probably twenty years ago, the last time. But um, you know, he was a big evangelical fundamentalist. Um, uh, he was a Methodist, uh, and everybody liked him around town. He was you know one of those types of you know figures. And, you know, I think at one point when I was like 14, 13, you know, he came out and said, I never was really saved. I thought I had accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior truly 25 years ago. But, you know, certain things, I heard a preacher, and then I, I considered that maybe certain things in my life were he, he's pointing out that, you know, I wasn't really saved. So he did the whole sinner's prayer again and everything else, all right, with tears. And I think he was sincere, all right, at least in his own way. Well, then the same problem happens six or seven years because people are egging him on or somebody else. This problem where you either convince yourself, and it's like the exact opposite. You either convince yourself you're never really assured. You go through this so-called uh, need for internal testimony of insurance four or five times throughout your entire life, and it's, a, and it's a strain, all right? Or you simply claim you simply never come to any kind of repentance. You're yeah. as prideful as you can possibly believe, as you possibly can be. Because you said you were born again once, you were born again, and you're always saved. It doesn't matter. The Baptist pastor could have just, you know, committed adultery with seven women in the in the church. It happened, you know, the cases. All right, and he just backslid, but he was still saved. All right, the, um, rinse, the rinse and repeat soteriology. Exactly, and and, and I, you know, this I saw this destroy people's lives. Yeah. All right. I saw it actually they can talk about people getting in, you know, uh, uh, problems with, or you know. Are they part of the true church here or there? But it was far worse in issues I saw in Protestantism. And they can claim, well, this guy died having the assurance of his salvation. Yeah, he also died believing insane things. And 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 basically, you know, do all kinds of crazy stuff because he, he was once saved, always saved. So, mm -hmm. you know, he didn't, you know, they can claim that that's not a license to sin. But I can tell you, it was a license to sin for a lot of people, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and you know they were like, well, I, I committed this sin, you know, but I, you know, I still was, I was still cleansed by the blood of Christ, still, even though I did not repent at the time. I mean, it make a mock, it makes a mock of our Lord's words, who says, you know, what, what do we see? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. As we forgive, so we have to forgive those who trespass against us. All right. Our Lord says in the Gospels. And if we do not forgive men their trespasses, our Heavenly Father will not forgive us our trespasses. And he's talking about people who have a Heavenly Father, which means they have to be part of the church, they're Christians. So, but we're taught, we were taught growing up that once you're saved, all your sins are forgiven. All right? Well, if all your sins are forgiven after, and you don't, and you can and even if you commit a sin, it's still, and you don't have to ask for forgiveness, but it's still why forgiven. Say, why say the prayer? This, the, exactly. The whole, why do the baptism? Exactly. Why do well, they didn't believe baptism meant many things. Like exactly. Like an empty symbol. Um, and so you see the complete dis disintegration that happened uh, within within Protestantism. Now, you can probably say that some of this may have been a reaction to sort of state Lutheranism and state Presbyterianism that were claiming they were the true church and then attacking others. So, so people decided, let's just break it all down so we don't have to have any kind of institution. All right? And then, of course, you know, it turns into chaos. And what could the state Lutheran or the state Presbyterian clergy say? I mean, and, and you know, they had already, I mean, remember, they had, a, they had taken over the old positions of the Roman Catholic clergy in their country, right? And they expected you to meet them, and then you're just going to accept them because they have authority. Well, then you can also say, well, how did you get that authority? We overthrew the Roman Catholic Church, all right? Uh, and, you know, and it becomes a, a, an unsolvable quagmire because, one, they have a very selective appeal to the church fathers, all right? Because my my personal experience here has been when someone consistently reads like the Holy Scriptures and the church fathers, you start reading all those nine times out of ten, all right? If you if you say, look, oh well, we accept the ecumenical councils, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you're you're going to come up with two choices essentially: either you become an Orthodox Christian or you become a Roman Catholic. That's how that's how definite. 
the materialism. I think Ortland understands that. All right, uh, he doesn't. He rejects it, but I think he understands that's how. Every, that's how the. I think he understands the gravity of the of the choice, but is trying to avoid it. I think he's taking it out of context too, because there's history that goes with these. Oh, um, yeah. He has a superficial view, which is prosthenism uh, 101 from the very start. Superficiality. Their whole religion is superficial. I mean, I mean, Father Boniface grew up in it. I grew up in it. I don't, I mean, Reader John, I don't know if you had, you grew up with your background or what have you. Uh, Judaism. Okay. All right. But you grew up in the South, I assume, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. So you, you, you probably grew up around similar things that we grew up, even if you didn't grow up in. <clears throat> Oh yeah, the, the so, guy. Yeah, yeah that's we're, we're all sort of familiar with it. And again, I can tell you that this was like I remember when I was like seven, and like, oh, you have to go up. Uh, you know, I was like, well, the you know, you you know, I guess there was a sort of teaching. Oh, you're seven, you kind of understand your sins, so hmm. you go up to the older coal and you say the sinner's prayer, and, and you know, oh, you're born again. Okay, well, then, accountability. You know, I, yeah. Exactly. So then I get to be twelve or thirteen, and I'm like, well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I still have all these problems, and I guess I was never really saved. So then, whole thing goes, whole thing over again. All right. Then I'm like eighteen. Oh, so the whole thing over again. All right. And each time, I, I, you know, and and it wasn't just me. This wasn't. I, I thought, well, maybe I'm just simply, you know, some weird problems wrong with me. And no, no, no. A lot of us. The Protestants I grew up with uh, have the same issues, where you know they were they were being told they had assurance of salvation. Well, it turns out after a few years, they're not so assured of that anymore, despite the belief they their internal psychological belief in internal testament of the Holy Ghost. So they had no visit. They had the, the church bought the church building was simply a congregation of individuals. This is essentially what it was: you're an assembly of in, of atomistic individuals who gathered together to hear a preacher say things and sing some hymns. All right. We did not have an understanding. I mean, we had that. We had some of the Methodists and, you know, others uh, had these hymn books with, you know, like the Apostles' Creed and, you know, and all this stuff in the back of it. No one ever used it. The sermon sandwich. Yeah. So, so <laughs> essentially, we were an atomistic group of individuals who came together to hear a message and to sing some hymns and then to eat some food afterwards. All right. We had no understanding. We did not believe that there was a, uh, Instant, there was a organic under union of, of, of Christian believers uh, that were bound by the sacrament of baptism uh, through regeneration and confirmed by the Eucharist. Um, it was it was essentially everyone out for themselves, whether they acknowledged it or not. You know the the history of the church. I look at it this way: you have um, the Protestant Church looking at the Roman Catholic Church, saying we want to be free from tyranny. So we need, we want to be freedom. So they fought and had the reformation. And then you have the establishment of the church of England and that they want to be free from Catholicism. So we're for all for Liberty. And then you get the, the uh, Puritans and the Presbyterians and they're occurring out saying we want freedom, you know, and so we won't be free from the tyrant England. And so then they come over to America and they promote their view of freedom. And so, so then with the Presbyterian church, the idea is, Hey, you can be free and we can be free. And so if we make laws in our church that are, and I'm quoting their, their preliminary principles, uh, chapter two, where they say that we have a liberty to, and if we use that wrongly, if we're too strict or too loose, that doesn't matter because if we do something wrong to you, we don't violate your liberty. We don't violate our liberty. You have the liberty to just go somewhere else. And so, so then, that's, then That's the spirit of tyrants. America. Then they become and, their own tyrants. <laughs> exactly. And then um, too bad you're a victim, but you still have liberty. But mind you, what did they do to me and all my family or anyone else? Was uh, And so therefore we were, this is the freedom that America has too. The atomistic idea of you have your own liberty. You can do what you want. And so I, I was thinking of Galatians chapter 4, verse 17. They are zealous in your regard, not well, but they would exclude you that, ye might, that you might be zealous for them. And so these factions are trying to attract people into their midst and to, so that you are zealous for their cause 
and they want to pull you away from the true faith so that you're one of their boys and if you're not one of their boys well then we have the liberty to kick you out and you have the liberty to go elsewhere and so too bad if you get burnt and that's the spirit of the liberty mm -hmm. in our country so then it's not the church and so then it's a cult as a personality well there's i i'm probably not explaining it correct uh, the, the joke correctly or the saying correctly but it was something like there was no, nothing so much as the Pope as a strong Baptist pastor in his church. Uh, yep. It, it, may, it, it may have been something, something, something just, mm -hmm. essentially, you know, you know, they, he, I remember, I remember being at a, um, when I was a teenager, being at a free will Baptist uh, service. And, you know, the pastor was up there. He was like 85 and he had like, run everything for like 50 years. All right. Um, and he was extreme, but no one could get rid of him, no matter what. All right. And he was saying that, well, if the denomination does this, if they adopt this policy, we're going independent. If they do this, then we're going to go independent. I was like, isn't there supposed to be like a board of elders or deacons that's got to vote on some of this stuff? It, it, it was, it was, you know, it was essentially he, everything he said was, you know, win. All right. Um, and if you didn't like it, you just left. Um, there was, you know, that was as, as, far, as Father Boniface described it. You know, you could have extremely or totalitarian type uh, congregations, and you leave it. You start your own congregation if you don't like it. That, that was it was as simple as that. Uh, that's kind of what I've noticed I like... down here, though. It's a, it's a cult of personality, and the, the personality how people gravitate towards it. Yeah, we call emo emotional yeah. response. In orthodoxy, we warn people against things like an elder. An el yeah, an elder. elderism. You know, yeah. there are there are true elders, obviously, yeah. and you know there are like uh, abbots and what have you. But you look in like the monastic tradition, uh, they you know you will have you know you, the abbot is the the at let's say the office of abbot in a monastery is an office, okay. And the abbot of the monastery has to have the fundamental realization that he's a temporary holder of this office. There's going to be, there ideally should be a long line of people. There's a line of people before him, there's a line of people after him. He is a guardian of that, of, of, of a deposit, just like a bishop is a guardian of a deposit. All right? You're, you know, you're not there to, um, you know, create something new or what have you. All right? Uh, that's, you know, that's, it's not about your personality. Because you know you're going to die, and then you're going to go to judgment, and there are going to be people after you. And I can guarantee you, or well, I shouldn't guarantee that, but I, anyone, when you're on your deathbed, the last thing you should be thinking about is, uh, you know, um, you know. Uh, sorry, I'm, 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 I'm going. I'm, 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 I've gone over time. All right, um, I'll let you all talk, and I'm going to go ahead and head out. Okay, gentlemen, me too. Thank you very much for, uh, for the stream. I appreciate it. No problem. Have a great night. All right. Benedict Shita. Benedict Shita. Thank you. Okay. Uh, somebody asks, are there ethnic personalities among American Protestants? Leadership is based on a certain ethnicity, and their successor should be of the same ethnic group and tribe. Um, to some degree, uh, that does exist in Protestantism, but usually there are enough distinctions that uh, I would say that people don't really overlap from the different groups. Um, there's also differences in, politi in politics, etc. Um, kind of a weird question, but is it possible for the noose to prevent someone in their youth from embracing heterodoxy? Um, we are a unique creation from God, and so God can use our hearts for enlightenment even when we're unaware of him. It is possible. Um, it's, you know, I mean, granted... It's not, I wouldn't necessarily say it's like explicit, miraculous, etc., but certainly God can make use of whatever He wants uh, to help people come closer to the truth uh, if they're warned. Um, I mean, you know, it, there's even intuition that keeps people from getting killed every day. Um, and it's inexplicable, but well, not to us, but we because we do believe in divine promptings, etc. Uh, even if they don't rise to the level of the miraculous. Um, okay, so with that, um, there was one more. Um, there was one more video, which I know that we've uh, I'm, that basically 
it was discussed about um, possibly, uh, what's the word, doing a review on that. The, the stream actually went a little longer than I was expecting. I don't know if you guys would be interested in reviewing it. It's this uh, it's a, this David Erhan uh, video. If, if, I don't David know Hunt? You know. No, David Erhan, not David Hunt. <laughs> no, <laughs> You know David Hunt? The dispensationalist? Uh, well, know, yeah. mm -hmm. Okay. A Woman Rides the Beast. Um, give me okay. a second. Let me... Seduction of Christianity. Yep. Give me one moment. I'm gonna put this up here, and we'll okay. So we're gonna take time. We'll tackle this one. Give me a moment, and let me share the screen. And let's do this one. David, the real Medwire. Once again, we're gonna be taking a look at the TOs and. One of their new arguments, and I say new because it's, well, it's new to me as far as I'm con concerned. Now, the primary argument and why we are heretics, according to the fake orthodox, is, well, we broke canons. We're breaking canons. We break XYZ canons, and that's why we are. No, it's actually because you're commuting with heretics and sometimes adopting their positions. But, okay, yeah, you can straw man it this way. Heretics. That was the argument that I personally heard from many Sweden fanboys from many different fake products. <laughs> and then I watched. The All right, fanboys, you back fanboys. me up here. <laughs> back me up, fanboys. All the fanboys in the in the chat in the house. Oh so God. ridiculous. Reply stream from uh, Sweden. I didn't feel the need to reply to it. I even made a poll on Twitter. Most people said don't reply to it. So I just moved on. But uh, new, but he's doing it anyway. Information uh, came up as I was researching about church history, and I would like to present them and show you how they also prove that uh, that fake orthodoxy is indeed fake and not authentic orthodoxy. So we're going to be taking uh, a uh, first of all. Let's take a look at the argument actually. So the, the communion line are this is yeah, I, I want to make sure that this is on one two five because this is you know. a new argument. So from the from the stream, their argument changed from well, I'm not certain if this was if the argument really changed from Sweden, but the argument in the stream is basically this: if you preach heresy bareheaded, and if you're not condemned, then those that are that are not condemning him, those that are in communion with with these people, they're heretics. So to simplify, well, to be clear. What he's mumbling on about is Canon 15 of the First Second Council, which says that you're still supposed to flee a heretic even if he hasn't been conciliarly condemned. By it. Let's say you have Bishop A and he's a heretic, mm -hmm. and you have Bishop B who's in communion, who doesn't believe in what Bishop A says, but is still in communion with Bishop A. Well, Bishop B then is a heretic. And if you're and anyone that's in communion with Bishop B as a result or anyone that's in communion with Bishop C and the image or so on and so forth, everyone in that line is a heretic. One person is enough to turn everyone in that line a heretic. This is why, again, you have so many different fake Orthodox groups because they think, oh, you're a heretic, you're a heretic, and they're not in communion with each other. This is why they're so disunited. There's such a disunity in this world. Mm. This is a stupid argument, um, and I'm going to yeah. just say that yeah. right now. He hasn't um, read it either. He hasn't read yeah. Canon 15. Yeah. yeah, not only has he not read Canon 15, he's ignoring all of church history, I guess with his little stick figures here, but the, the reality <laughs> is that when Arius preached heresy, nobody in the church willingly stayed in communion with him. When Nestorius preached heresy, nobody in the church willingly stayed in communion with him. Until this is clear that there's no such thing as this magical communion line, because here's what he's trying to pretend. What he's trying to pretend is that you have heretic A here, uh, who's a heretic? Definitely bad. Then you have heretic be a guy here who's not a heretic but still recognizes the heretic. Not really sure how that works, but okay. And then he's in communion with totally orthodox guys. Here's the problem. In reality, this guy's a heretic. This guy is usually also a heretic but not as loud. And these guys are usually also her heretics as well. They're just better at hiding it but not even trying that hard. Well, you can also be co-laborers in that heresy. Exactly, uh, and complicit in that heresy. Exactly, and so you know, the, but the whole point is with the heresy of ecumenism, it is so widespread that this argument is stupid. But mm -hmm. let's continue. Sure. 
So is this, or is this orthodox? Is this true doctrine? No, it's not. It's not a correct orthodox interpretation of how canons work. And we're going to show you with historical evidence. So the first one is going to be about post Ephesus. Uh, many students of Theodoret of Mopsuestia, after the Council of Ephesus and after the reunion of Alexandria and Antioch, which they were uh, not in communion until 423. After the union, after John of Antioch accepted the council, accepted what St. Kirill said, pretty much, not all of it, but pretty much accepted most of the things they, they said, uh, many people, many, many people in that community, they were still preaching double subjectivity, double subject in Christ. They were still, they were still preaching Nestorianism. Theodoret of Syrus, in fact, was, was arguing that Nestorius should not have been condemned, that he should not have been deposed and he should be reinstated. So the Council of Ephesus says he's uh, excommunicated and there's there's not a, there's not a double subject in Christ. The Christ is one. In spite of the Council of Ephesus saying all of this, years later, what do you get? Well, you still get people doubting it. You still get people bareheaded, openly preaching against the council, just like the Council of Nicaea with Eusebius of Nicomedia. But I'm not going to go too much into the detail with that. So that itself, the, now, if you take a look at the bishops, well, bishops, Theodore of Syrus, and many of the people who taught, who had the same Nestorian idea, uh, they were still in communion with John of Antioch. And John of Antioch was in communion with St. Kirill, and they were in communion with the rest of the Orthodox world. So by that logic, the entire church... He's also factually wrong on the Nestorian controversy. Mm. No, people were not actually exercising open communion with uh, with Nestorius on the part of St. Kirill. St. Kirill was accepting in people uh, who had refused communion with Nestorius. This was covered in the Third Ecumenical Council, and this all took place within two years. So his entire stupid argument is false. It was in heresy. So very, very true Orthodox that were saving us. Unless you want to become a Baptist and use the uh, the the trail of blood argument that Baptists use, well, you can't really convince. What does that even mean? I don't know. So, the church wasn't in heresy. <laughs> so, it's this historical event vindicates us, vindicates real authentic orthodoxy. Another event that the stream, the reply stream talked about was Saint Gregory the Elder. Now, Saint Gregory the Elder, they, they mentioned Saint Gregory the Elder, but they seem to have missed the point that I was trying to make. Saint Gregory the Elder, after the Council of Nicaea, was preaching semi-Arianism. It doesn't matter if it's semi-Arianism or it's full-on Arianism. Both are condemned positions. No, semi -Arianism it's semi -Arianism. Is just yeah, and on top of that, I mean, in the other David Erhan live review, live stream review we did, we covered Gregory the Elder. This is, well, you know, I'm going to... I'm gonna stop this video here. I'm, I'm gonna. It's, there's four more minutes. I'll just let's just finish. Okay. Cope with the Council of Nicaea and these people knowingly did that. So Saint Gregory the Elder, he professed semi-Arianism for three years, bareheaded, and the Church vindicates him. Did we address this? And, and his son, Saint Gregory, his son defended him, and the monks. There are several monks that excommunicated. Defended him on the basis that he was being misunderstood and misled. Given from him. So let's take a look at this. So the monks are obviously doing what the TOs are doing. They're obviously doing what the fake Orthodox will have done. They will, they will say, oh, you're preaching heresy bareheaded. Got to protect my communion, bro. In actual fact, Gregory the Elder ended up repenting. Um, and through the intercessions of St. Carol and the monks then accepted him back. This is this is stupid. But his sons defended him. So who's right here? The sons or the monks? Well, he... Son. One son. Not multiple sons. Either yeah. way, actually, the monks are still in communion with those that are in communion with him. So either way, you know, you... the history still vindicates us. And the other example is Pope St. Andreas. If, uh, like... if you read the history, you must actually learn something, dude. <laughs> Yeah, he just, yeah, instead of maybe reading like a history book about it, like maybe read the fathers themselves. Yeah, uh, Protestant history Elder, book. Also <laughs> yeah, but that's what we're getting well, so he, far. He's, uh, <laughs> he's, he's regurgitating times, academics. So. Yeah. Uh, publicly, again, publicly, bareheaded. So we're fitting all of the criteria that the TOs uh, want us to fulfill. Uh, he was in charge of many local councils. Some of them arguably were semi arian councils. And in spite of that, he was still a pope. Right? And he recanted both St. Gregory and St. Liberius. They both recanted from their positions. Uh, ironically, the, uh, the Roman Catholic Church. Huh? By the way, his cartoon there with the man with a hat, it's not true orthodoxy. He doesn't have a beard. Yeah, I don't know what that. I don't know what that is. is this, this, this is just showing off the. I mean, David Erhan couldn't. I, I know what it is. I, mean, I don't know what this is. The this kids, is the kids call it cringe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Church doesn't recognize Saint Liberius, but the point I'm trying to make here, ultimately, with this video, is 
that you have all of these historical events that vindicates our church, and it shows that your church is not correct in schisming. Schisming. Because of the calendar I, issue or from surgery. If there's one thing I will say that upsets me more than anything else, and I know there are people who disagree with me on this, it is the recent transformation of schism from a noun into a verb. In which 100 years ago, there was a worse form of surgeonism, 100, 200 years ago. And now I know a, the typical TO response to this. I know the typical TO response to this. They will use the first, second council, can 15. Well, here's the problem. The, the rules of that canon didn't apply during the council. It was, you have to admit that that, that canon was always true, even before that council. If you say that- Of that course it was always true. The very controversy you're talking about produced the conciliar basis for canon 15 400 years later. And then the truth of that canon was created in that council, then you have a totally screwed up epistemology, a totally screwed up ecclesiology. For example, you have, you have dogmas, you have canons regarding the divinity of Christ. Well, that was always a canon. That was always dogma. It wasn't created in a council. Similarly, you're not saying anything. He's not saying anything. There, he's there's just, not he's actual, just, he's just, just, just words putting <laughs> words there. There's words. Clearly, that was also. Uh, always true. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that even in your interpretation, which is a wrong interpretation, but in your interpretation of the of Canon 15 of the first second council, it applied before the council itself. So it doesn't really matter if it was before or after. But either way, we, see, we check uh, church history, examples of church history. He, he, Words! He, he, dig he, figures! Well, he, he, he does realize like, he does realize like <laughs> councils confirm what has already been happening throughout the, the the church from the beginning. I don't know that he does re realize that. He, I know that he believes in it's, councils and canons and things. And, and that alphabet soup, but yeah. <laughs> it's it's the right of personal and revisionism. It's yeah. insane. This is insane. In many cases, many instances, and there are many more instances that they rejected, by the way. Many more instances, instances, many more instances. that vindicates yeah, yeah, yeah. Like what? the authentic like what? Orthodox like what? church. Like what? And but, so the point that I'm trying but, to make here is that you can't look at these examples, you can't look at church history and still be a fake orthodox. It's it's difficult to remain as such. So thank you all for watching. Uh, stay away from fake orthodoxy for the sake of uh -huh, your soul. Yeah. God bless you all. Stay I'll away from David Erhan for the sake of your soul. Anyway, yeah. uh, let's take a look here. This, <laughs> some comments. The video looks like it was made on a Nintendo DS sketchboard. You're probably right. And that's a like Game Boy Advance. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, Game Boy Advance. He's a genius. He understands the canon better than the church, council, or fathers. Yeah, this... Okay, first off, I'm going to say this once because Larika Enoch was... We've covered this video or these concepts. We've Sorry, I, I, I went off and then I went back to see what you were looking at before I went to bed. And then, and then you were like, ah, oh, no, not so, this. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the point is that um, we covered this before, but sometimes, as a courtesy, we'll cover things that are asked for again in a live review. We will probably make a clip of this, but in the future, if it is something we've covered, even if it's not a live review, I'm gonna review, I'm gonna refer back to a video that we covered it on or we're going to ask for like donations for stuff like that because I I don't want to keep talking about the same people about the same arguments over and over. I understand this did not have a live review. Now it does. But if I have to hear a retreaded argument or something we've had to cover before, I'll cover it. But at, at the very least, you know, help us out. Help the channel out. Well, um, you know, it's, to me, uh, it's interesting because you're going to have to point out, and this is what we've said for years. W give me an example of Saint Athanasius. You know, you know, uh, being you know confronted by an Arian priest or bishop, so called, mm -hmm. and then saying, "Okay, well, you're not technically deposed, so we're going to celebrate." Yeah, that didn't happen. That's not going to happen. Um, and or are you so semi-Arian? <laughs> well, the, what, what they're trying to claim is sort of an indirect communion. That's what, what this is approaching, yeah. I think, yeah. from what I remember. We had a video about this like four years ago. And this is like the fifth. I, 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 made, a, I made a snide comment in the chat about this is the tenth time we've, we've had to address this. Hmm. But um, almost, I, I can tell you, every single one of those cases in which they can claim an indirect communion, you're dealing with somebody lied to somebody along the way. Right. Right. In the case of Rome, 
the like the case of Liberius in the uh, so-called semi-Aryans within Syria. They be, what happened is uh, the Roman Church said, "Will you sign the Nicene Creed?" Which at that point, by the way, did not have the part about the you know the you know Holy Ghost, Lord and Giver of Life. Okay, it was added the Second Council. So all these um, all these figures signed the creed. Well, then it turns out that a lot of them didn't disbelieve. These were Arians who had sort of accepted the divinity of Christ, but then they denied the divinity of the Holy Ghost. Right. So essentially, you had a you had a external communal communion based upon false pretenses, where the Orthodox bishops in Italy thought that they were in communion with putative Orthodox bishops in Syria. All right. And it and that and that lasted for about three years, and the whole thing just exploded. Uh, so yeah, I mean. You're going to have to lie to somebody along the way to get these things to go through. Yeah. And, if, and if you do, that's, there's no real communion. It's, it's, it's just something on paper that doesn't yeah, this is, the it's reality. Just, but the problem with this is that it's not even a very good argument to mm -hmm. begin with because it's not applicable to today. Ecumenism is widespread. It's not like, oh, there's one bad bishop and there's a whole bunch of good ones, which is what the usual garbage argument is. There's a lot of really bad bishops that people don't bother to investigate. Look, if people are lazy, that's not our fault. Um, but well, there's, it, it, there's been a change in terms. Though. Like, if you look at the father, or at least the fathers we have in English, when they're talking about somebody that's part of the church, they usually use Orthodox or Catholic in the in the sense, not Roman yeah. Catholic, but right, yeah. yeah, or they say true Orthodox versus like the people in world Orthodoxy, they use canonical. Well, what does that mean? Yeah, it means following the canons, which they're not doing either. But we're so, we're following the canons, so right. who, who's so, really following the canons? Who's exactly, really the church? Yeah, I know, and yeah. that's the, exactly the point is, as I've said before, and I'll say it again. A lot of the times, the term canonical orthodoxy is nothing but marketing. Um, not they actually invent, the marketing. Yeah, they, they actually <laughs> invented the term world orthodoxy, but then yeah. they, they realized it sounded bad. Um, that's not yeah. our fault either. <laughs> Too many syllables. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, well, the, the thing was because it was Meyerdorf who started it, but then, you know, yeah, a lot right. of the true Orthodox just got in on it because they're like, oh, you want to be in union with the world? Sure, you call yourselves world Orthodox guys. That's great. And so, you know, immediately they switched to canonical, which was just made up. But in any case, um, well, all right. I, so, I, I noticed that what happens uh, this you know, old hat stuff. Um, you ask many of these fighting from within, and that's the, really the only people we're dealing with in, the, in this line of argument. The idea that, do they believe ecumenism is a heresy? Well, if they say, well, I don't know, well, then we're not, then we're dealing well, with something that's, that's totally... Well, to them, to them, it would be semi-ecumenism. <laughs> okay, so, so if they say ecumenism is a heresy, if they if they say that's a heresy, if they say they accept the Roque or Anathema, 1983... Which a lot of them are no, are no longer saying, but if they but they used to be, they used to say that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, can you name me some ecumenist heretics in the page? You're saying ecumenism is a heresy and it's afflicting world orthodoxy. Okay, name me some of these people. All right. Um, and they don't. Uh, at least the clergy won't, because they know as soon as they begin to name people, well, why are you in communion with those people who are here? The finger points back at them. Yeah. Exactly. They're going to have to justify some sort of action. Now it's a little bit easier for some of those like Rocor MP people to go down that route because they can like attack Bartholomew. But the problem is that always comes back with things Kirill was doing. Yeah, um, like and, the Monophis nights. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or his, you know, Patriarch Kirill last year saying that there were a lot of people in the Moscow Patriarchate that it was a very small minority. We're declaring a holy war like he's a Muslim. Yeah. Well, well, there were people in the MP it was a very small minority, but they were loud who were like, "We need to get rid of all communal content." And Carol was like, well, if we had done that, I could have never talked to Pope Francis to get my view about the war in Ukraine out. Uh, it was like, that was his big his big coup he pulled off. He had, like a, it, it, it was, he had, a, he had a Skype the, meeting with Pope Francis. It wasn't oh, okay. when he thought it was. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and everybody just loved the Havana document. That was just great, yeah. right? So <laughs> my, my point is that they, it's, I think they know what's happening. This is not a case, like, in, like, Oh, well, they don't really know, and someone's lying to somebody. It's a cognitive dissonance. Yeah. That's what it is. So, you know, you're, you're dealing with these... I mean, again, this is not, you know, Pope Liberius or his successor in good faith making agreement with a group of bishops in Syria who he thinks are orthodox. And mm -hmm. then, the whole, then the whole thing blows up after four or five years. 
and the truth is revealed. And by the way, St. Basil the Great actually wrote a letter called To the Westerners, hmm. where he warned the bishops in Italy that these people are heretics. Um, and he told them not to, not to go through with this. And, of course, they didn't listen to St. Basil because at that time, St. Basil was actually not in communion with uh, Italy because of the whole immediate issue about who was the proper bishop of Antioch. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, that's sort of what happens in actual Orthodox churches is if some sort of agreement is made like that and you're dealing with actual people's Orthodox mentality, the truth comes out one way or the other. Right? And they, and they yeah. re retread stale arguments like Look at the quote unquote fake Orthodox, how they're splitting up into all these uh, uh, jurisdictions. Let's bring back the chart. Bring back that chart, Father. I was like, that's like, 30 oh, the year, chart? That's, like a, that's like a 30 year old argument, 30 to 50 year old argument. Well, you know, I, you know, Reader John, I remember um, a few years ago when I had a Facebook account and they used to have like this discussion groups. I mean, I didn't, anyway, um, yeah. when they had the 2018, you know, schism between the fan R and the MP. Mm hmm. I was I was like thinking that oh you know this is going to be an important event but you know it's just nothing's really it's not going to affect a lot of people's mentality mm -hmm. but there actually were dozens of people who like showed up in my comments and were like well I guess the old calendarist had a point like, yeah I was, it was, I was like I was, I was like this <laughs> I was is what's bringing this about I mean <laughs> well everything we've said for decades and it's because their whole mentality of what the church was was based upon essentially a neo papal understanding of papal yeah that and you know and i would always sort of use that argument but that was all it took for some of these people to yeah the you know, scales fell away from their eyes yeah. yeah now a lot of them ultimately didn't really choose to do much um after that uh and and remember there was this period for about six months after the mp fan where the mp was putting out like feelers to true orthodox in greece and they went nowhere because yeah. I think, because I know, I knew exactly, I know from a fact what they did in Greece. They were like trying to look out, uh, they approached different synods and look, were looking for like a deal. They were looking and, for leverage. Yeah. yeah. Well, what, well, the problem was that there's, it, it demonstrates the surge in uh, or official so called world orthodox mentality, which is that you can always make a deal. Every man has his price. Yeah, well, it's the, same, they, it's the same style on this MP, right? Yeah. Well, that, well yeah, that's how they, <laughs> well, the fan, to be honest, the fanor has, has the same idea, you know? Their yeah, idea is that different backer though. <laughs> exactly. Um, I I heard that from you know various world orthodox clergy was like, oh, if only you guys were offered a better deal, you know, and you know, that that's not what we're talking. The better deal is you anathematize ecumenism and surgianism and modernism. That's the deal we want. Will you anathematize that? And they're like, no, we're not. We're not. Doing that. Right. So, you know, ultimately, it, you know, it went it went nowhere. Um, and they had to get a. They had to get a hold of that really, really quick, because there was this like two or three Ukrainian MP bishops that were like, "Well, there are these millions of old calendarists, and we're going to form an agreement with them and such." They were sort of trying to threaten the. That was that they're, was their they strategy. They were trying to get leverage. Yeah, That's exactly. Was. That was yeah. their strategy with the new calendar state church of Greece. They were hoping that, well, what if we recognize them? Well, they were never really going to do that, no. uh, but they were hoping that they could scare somebody. In Greece, to you know, you know, not doing this, or in Athens, not doing this or that, and, and if the fan art is a lot uh, more crafty than the Sergianists in Moscow gave it credit for, the Masons who run the fan art are not, you know, they're they're heretics and apostates. That's true, but you know, they're they're you know, they weren't, they had a lot more backing on this. Well, they've been doing that for a lot longer. Yeah, they're you know they're yeah they're you're both dealing with uh, two forces. That uh, you know, come up against each other, and uh, you know, happy. We see the results now, and now, of course, the uh, MP is on the verge of some, as they as they said in their publication, drastic decision regarding the Romanian patriarch. Uh, oh and it yeah, has that mess. <laughs> yeah, well, because remember, the Romanian patriarch has now claimed it's created the Romanian Orthodox Church in Ukraine. And, you know, they're taking in large numbers of uh, UOC MP uh, Romanian ethnic Romanians. It's in parts uh, and, of Moldova, I think, too. Well, yeah, but now, yeah. In that, and it, because remember, the whole Moldovan issue has been a problem since the 90s. Yeah. <laughs> right? And now it's, now it's expanded to Ukraine. Because sort of Romanian, Romanian patriarchate has this almost view that wherever there are Romanians, they can 
can just go wherever. Have it's Romanian it. mirror or something. <laughs> their, their own version of like Ruski mirror is just yeah, Romanian yeah. mirror. Yeah. Um, well, the fanner has the same idea. They'll do the same right. thing. So, yeah. um, and I think obviously um, with the Moscow Patriarchate, like break with you know with Romanian Patriarchate, I'm, maybe. And remember, uh, the Bulgarian Patriarch died. Patriarch neophyte. Yeah, and um, yeah. and the fa and it was well known. Bartholomew he already did the funeral, but he was going to preside at the funeral. He insulted him during the funeral. Oh yeah, he was like, "Well, he, you know, they may exactly for not accepting the." He still heard about Crete, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They, yeah, exactly. I don't think the Bulgarian Patriarch went to Crete. I'm not. I don't think they sent anybody to Crete. I'm not no, they didn't. Uh, there were one of the four that didn't. Yeah, it was so, Antioch, Bulgaria. And, and of course, yeah. obviously, Bartholomew. I think his presence there was initially meant to provoke a new situation. Because I think mm -hmm. in the last moment, I, or I think he was hoping that the Bulgarian patriarchate would allow sort of Epiphanius Kiev and his people to sort of can celebrate with Bartholomew, because that's sort of how the Fenner's strategy was, you know, went about with this to get agreement by celebration, more or less. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, in, you know, it ended up that they showed up, and then the Moscow patriarch showed up, but they just sort of stood in the. Uh, I think they stood like like in the end and just stood in the church. There was no they didn't do anything. communion by photo op. <laughs> I don't even know. I don't even know. You know, I don't. I haven't looked at the photos. I don't even know if, if the OCU people went up and took communion from Bartholomew. Uh, I don't. I don't even know if they they did that. I know, be interesting. Yeah, well, maybe they did. I, I don't. I don't really know. The big Bulgarians didn't want him there. Well, so. obviously now now they're going to have a new Bulgarian patriarch. Um, there's something weird. It's already released yeah. the list too, and it doesn't look yep. good for them. <laughs> there, there's something strange, and and maybe I just don't understand it. I, have, I need to read and talk to more people about Bulgaria, and and, and even the, even Serbia, in regards to this, that they have this outside, they have this view where, I mean, like the the, the ecumenical patriarch, they have to admit that he has pull in the mentality of some of these people. Mm -hmm. uh, remember back in 1990 or 91 when the Soviet Union was you know, on its way out and the Georgian, there was this controversy in Georgia where I don't know, if I think it was almost Fanar generated a controversy but the Fanar said something like, well, the Georgian church is has never been autocephalous never in history been autocephalous. Oh yeah, the new autocephalies that's right, yeah. And Remember the Georgian Church. Well, the Georgian, some Georgian claim they were all settled since the fourth century, but it's generally admitted it's probably since the seven thirties or seven forties. The Patriarch of Antioch gave them a tomb of all the settled. Yeah, they were one of the first. Yeah. So I mean, because obviously they were. I think after the after the middle eight, eight, eighth century, they called their patri they called their Catholicus Catholicus Patriarch. Okay? Mm -hmm. So Bartholomew was like, no, 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 you, you're never all settled, never. Um, and so he convinced them. To accept a document autocephaly from him, um, and you know, remember the Bulgarians essentially did the same thing in the, like 1949, 1950, yeah. what have you. Uh, there was a famous Patrick Pavla in 1994 met with Bartholomew, and he says, "You are the mother, we are the daughter." Karl Czech, Pavla, Czechia, Slovakia, yeah, yeah, they're, they're, exactly, and hold the poles, etc. Um, where you know. You know, I have I have a feeling that that Slavic pull is only so strong with some of them. There's that that's where Bartholomew is counting on. That you know, I, so many of these people have this idea that their their canonicity again it's a papalistic idea. Their can, canonicity depends upon what the patriarch Bartholomew patriarch so called patriarch Constantinople says. All right. It's worth noting that this is also. Uh, just you again. This is the ecumenist period in the 20th century, where literally they're rewriting uh, the you know the structure of what the historic church was before well, our eyes. Well let, well, let me make this comment. The fan art did try stuff like this before it became ecumenist. Oh yeah, yeah. The no, problem, well, that the, we know. The yeah, problem was that they, I think there's there the problem now is that you're having this you know the whole three all three the three crown argument that Elpidorphus made. They have yeah. this official position paper. Back oh, in the yeah. 17th century, when the Fanner wanted to suppress a patriarchate or an, or an autocephalous archbishop, it would 
kind of make a pretense of having a council, but then it give a bunch of money to the sultan, he would just arrest them. All right. So the, everyone sort of knew what that implied. All right. Um, it, it was just sort of base, base and canonicity and borderline criminality. All right, by somebody. Well, technically, though, he was um, an ethnarch. Though. He wasn't a patriarch. Yeah, at exactly. That time. I mean, he, he was both. Patri he claimed to be ecumenical patriarch and ethnarch of the Roman nation. Yeah. And the Roman nation meant anybody who was Orthodox. So the Sultan essentially gave him theoretically unlimited power under yeah, his review. Yeah, content. His uh, I mean, Ottoman he, captivity. Exactly. So he could essentially <laughs> do many things that he should not have been allowed to do. I mean, there were people who resisted that. that that's the whole reason for right, the Aryan yeah. uh, break, uh, schism, et cetera, in the 1860s. The, massive reaction. The only one who interests me right now in World Orthodox is uh, what's the Serbian patriarch said, Porfiry. Because he kind of stalemated the whole Macedonian thing with the uh, Constantinople. We preempted it by giving the autocephaly. Yeah. <laughs> because, because then Bartholomew couldn't do that. Yeah. Bartholomew could just simply say we recognize them as bishops. I think their official position is, like, you know, the Banar's position is sort of like the OCA and the Japanese, yeah. sort of like Russian bishops just who are acting de facto autocephalous, but they're really no more than autonomous. No. Um, but you know we're going to see more more transpire, especially as El as Bartholomew is eighty four, eighty five now, I believe. Yeah. Elpidorphros well. is, is going to be almost certain to be the uh, the guy next guy, and he's more radical than even Bartholomew. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, if you can believe that. I mean, I mean, remember he's the he's. I think he's, he's just more outspoken because yeah, Bartholomew. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, it's it's probably much. like it's probably the same thing as the the John Paul and Ratzinger, a dynamic. They really mm -hmm. have they really have this. They had different styles. Well, that's all. Well, and you yeah. can say anything in America. You can't dirty. Yeah, but I can. But I can. You know, obviously. So uh, <laughs> we're going to see what transpires, and uh, um, more than likely, uh, the next two years are going to have you know more trends happen. Though I do not see, uh, you're not going to see a resumption. I, I, you know, maybe I'll eat my words, but you're not going to see a resumption of communion. Between the Moscow Patriarchate and uh, with the Fanar. The Fanar's claim, of course, is they never broke communion. I don't, okay. I don't see that any time in the near future. Actually, yeah, I, see it, I see it deepening, actually. Yeah, it's going to get worse. Exactly. Yeah. Because remember what's happening in the Baltic countries. I think part of it's the fact that the United States, the U.S. government, you have to, the State Department knows that they can't win in the Ukraine situation. Mm -hmm. So the, I think sort of the Western liberal uh, uh, argument is just sort of uh, be as annoying as possible. To, to, well, I'm to, starting to I'm starting to read people over in Moscow start to refer to it as a schism. So if they're well, well to remember that, the if, if you look on the Moscow Patriarchate's website when they reference this, remember the Moscow Patriarchate appointed a new exarch for their African missions. All right. Okay, yeah. And the Greek Patriarch of Alexandria claimed they opposed this bishop. Again. Um, and then and then the Moscow Patriarchate said that they don't regard this as valid because Patriarch Theodorus is in schism. Right. Yeah. They actually say he's not part of the church. He's in system. Same with right? Bartholomew. Yeah. So, um, you know that, you know that's. Uh, I think they they've had to, you know, that's their position. Mm -hmm. So, what do you okay. think, about Joseph? Um. Well, uh, we're actually heading into the one hour and fifty eight minute mark. Uh. So. Uh, yeah. I wanted to. Uh, I wanted to say thank you for everyone who uh, participated today. Uh, I want to say thanks to Reader John for being here, Father Boniface. Uh, thank you so much um, for Carl, for Vladika Enoch, obviously, of course. Um, and so, again, I've been scrolling the um, the support the channel thing. I'm going to just give you a quick rundown of what we're doing. Um, uh, I'm going to give you a quick rundown of what we're doing. Um, okay. Uh, so it's like a scratching sound, but anyway, <laughs> right. well, um, in any case, we're trying to, uh, first off, I've been working on a few things, we're working on the cafe. Uh, I wanted to touch upon a book. I'll probably do that as a second video. Uh, the new prayer book that, uh, we came out with I'm doing a new, another book that I'll be working on very soon. Uh, I'm looking forward to Bishop Enoch coming out with a video tomorrow. Uh, and if it sounds like I've been asking for help a bit more the past couple of days, just to break it down, um, God willing, assuming everything goes okay, I'm going to be dropping off my car finally after months of trying to find a mechanic to a mechanic who will be able to 
allegedly fix it. Maybe he'll just tell me to throw it in the junkyard and I'll have no car. I have no idea. Uh, but um, when we do ask for help, I, I it's it's for real. It's not because, you know, I'm looking to, you know, have like a great big party or anything. Like it's it's a, it's like usually it's because there's some bill. And in this case, I'm letting you know, God willing, we'll have a diagnosis and I'll be able to tell you more about it. But um, for the vehicle, but I got to drive it down and drop it off at the mechanic's shop and hopefully it gets fixed. There's a lot of issues. Uh, it's failed inspection uh, because there are frame issues. This is a collision service, so they should be able to fix those. But now we're having the new problem with the heater. So um, basically the radiation system is going crazy, and so the car is almost undrivable. But in any case, um, we've survived this. I've survived this long going doing this. So again, I just am going to ask and say thanks um as it comes and hopefully uh we can get that support it is the beginning of great lent uh i'm sure everyone's looking forward to it um you know so of course there is something to be said for more prayer and more fasting uh so pray for us as well and uh so in that case i wanted to say again thank you for everybody for your prayers for your donations for your assistance for kind words for your comments for your questions and um again uh thank you everyone for being here and uh you know have a good night uh master bless the praise of the holy father the lord jesus christ god have mercy amen amen, amen.